Hello everyone, this is Migo Hunter, and today I want to present something that's completely different. This isn't a Yomi match or anything. I just want to make my own own video just for fun. You know, it's nothing nothing too serious, but you know, some people have been asking, you know, some new players have been wondering, you know, if there's a tier list for Yomi and if there's, you know, a common consensus of what characters are good, what characters are not so good. So Here's the video addressing that, basically. I kind of want to give my own tier list of all 20 Yomi characters. Just break down um, each character and their um, their kit and innate. And just explain why they belong in the tier they're in. I'm sure there's a lot of tier lists out there. And that people are very subjective in tier list. But there's some... I'm sure you will find at least something in this tier list that you agree with. Or, you know, maybe you learned something new about a character. Um, but this is my personal tier list, and I'll explain why I put each character in a certain position. So, yeah, let's uh, let's get right into it. Firstly, wait, let me bring up my... Okay, there we go. Just had to bring something up, okay. So let's start, you know, look at each tier. So we got, I only break down to four tiers. Yomi is a fairly balanced game, where the tier, the tier list is pretty compressed. Um, you can win with any character. Any character can do work, um, but some obviously are better than better than others. And you know, <clears throat> part of you know, the tier list might factor into your character choices. But you know, I think matchups are still way more important in this game in Yomi, and also what play style that you prefer. So, yeah, now, this this tier list should not dissuade you from playing your favorite characters. Just to give you a sort of a overall view of where a character is placed. So anyway, um, let's start with, yeah, let's start with um, breaking out each tier. So I only have S, A, B, and C, as I explained as meta-defining, nearly perfect characters. And what I mean by meta-defining is characters that shape the game in a way that, you know, they are like the characters, the character strength basically is what you might compare other characters up to because they're just that good. And they have a lot of advantages, positive matchups, um, and often they are characters that you need to worry about when you when you're fighting in a tournament or whatever. So they're basically just characters that you need to watch out for when playing against them, and you might even need to bring out specific counters for. S tier characters are very good and have very good kits. Um, a tier, solidly strong, may have some flaws. Um, a tier characters are very good. Some some A tier characters I think maybe even border on S and debatably debates there yeah, debatably could be S but A tier characters do have certain flaws or you know certain um they have certain weaknesses or matchups that they have they struggle with so that's why they're an A they're very good characters but they do have downsides mm, for B we got capable characters but has weaknesses. So, um, these are characters that are basically very good. They're, they're still good characters, um, specialize in what they do, but will have more apparent weaknesses than Tier A. If you think Tier A is like very good, just overall strong characters, Tier B is like characters that, while are still good, they do have a certain weakness that your opponent might be able to exploit, or you have to cover, basically, when you play that character. Um, and finally, at C tier, <clears throat> C tier is pretty much like B, but just a notch, a notch down. It's just characters that have more obvious weaknesses will kind of struggle maybe more than tier B characters. Maybe have more bad matchups overall. But, you know, again, tiers, all characters in this game are good and perfectly playable. Just a tier C. If you want to, if you want to main a tier C character or like to play a tier C character, you might need to work harder than you know than a tier S character, obviously. Anyway, with that preface, let's begin. Um, <clears throat> I'll go. I'll start with the strong characters and sort of work my way down from there. So in tier S, the meta-defining characters. Let's start with our lawyer De Grey. So why does De Grey belong in S? Um, well, let's break down. Let's break down his kit. Well, first of all, let me actually let's do this. Yeah, let's bring this up here. 
so let's I'm gonna start I'm gonna break down each character by their characters innate the aces I want to put yeah the aces of the character are very important because that's a card you can consistently power up for so innate aces their abilities you know their abilities are usually um, what defines a character other than their um, tools and of course and then explain overall why they're good so yeah so let's look at the gray at tier why put the gray at tier s the start is innate moral high ground the opponent has more cards than you your special attacks and super attacks deal extra damage equal to the difference so this innate <clears throat> just makes the gray pretty much a gorilla really strong efficient character because the more the opponent builds like the, the primary default game plan of yomi is to build to a big hand of cards and you know be able to convert a lot of damage and have try to love resources but the great counteracts that just naturally with his innate because all your special cards and your all your face cards and your aces are powered up by how many cards your opponent has and you know the great can always power for aces basically he always has access to his bonus damage so this this innate is just really good it allows the great to play a lower hand than what you know other characters and let me look, let's look at his aces the grace aces um one of the best in the game um the grace aces um both sides of it are devastating the ace dodge is a recurring dodge that leads into a full combo no other character, by the way, can combo full off a dodge other than Setsuki. So having that attached to an ace is just ridiculous. And his other side of his ace, Final Arbiter, is a 1.2 speed, 20 damage ender. Which is very efficient. Not only is it very efficient, like 20 damage ender is um, pretty high on the, um, on the scale of ace supers. But it can also be powered up by his innate, his moral high ground. So basically... The greatest aces are monstrous, both sides of it, and they're both, and they see a lot of play. So, other than his aces, what does he have? His abilities. Troublesome rhetoric. His four, his four ability, where you can choose attack, block, or throw. You can choose a combat option, and the opponent reveals a combat option, you gain 12 life. It's super simple, and it's super effective, because it perfectly balances, it perfectly complements his seven ability on the seven which point counterpoint where you can discard a card to rotate this 180 degrees this this card right here is what makes the great also monstrous because it, it basically gives him access unless the opponent has a counter it gives him access to the fastest throw in the game if the opponent plays a fastest throw then you can just rotate to, to the attack side and just beat it it's so good and point and troublesome rhetoric on his four just protects his seven that much more so these two abilities combined, just ridiculous, and you can create a mix-up from it. And um, finally, if you look at his overall kit, you can see that he has a pretty good DP on his K. J is an okay ender. He has pretty average speeds, fastest throw in the game with his hit 7. And Pal Bunker is one card that stands out as really monstrous at 14 damage starter. Super slow, but it doesn't matter. The speed doesn't matter because you are a character with a recurring super dodge. So yeah, overall, the gray is a meta-defining character, I would say. Just because his overall kit is so good, he can be played a high hand or low hand. The gray does have bad matchups, mostly matchups that um, might leave him knocked down. But the gray can still play around being knocked down. And of course, the gray has access to a 0 0.2 speed attack. So... He can handle, he can wake up with his K when, as a panic button when he needs to. So you know the Gray's weakness is plenty of throws and being knocked down. Even then, he can still play around it. And he's a very scary character. So that's why the Gray's at S. Alright, moving on. The next meta-defining character I would like to put is Trok. Trok Bashar. So Trok is considered the strongest grappler in the game. And for good reason, because Throck is just, he's just so efficient. So let me, let's, let's just uh, start with his innate. His innate giant growth, when you block an attack of Joker, you attach your block and you power up um, his attacks and throws by one. So he can attach up to two blocks this way. 
and um, once you have two giant growth attached, you have access to your really, really good super. Really good A super. So why does Troc <clears throat> S? Well, I mean, oh yeah, plus he has Defense Mastery. Defense Mastery is just a really good tool for grapplers to deny the opponent card draw. So he has that on top of Giant Growth and 95 HP. So he's a really beefy character to start out. And the efficiency comes from his face cards and Giant Growth, just making his throws. Um, the standard grappler throw is 8 damage, but with 2 attached blocks, they become 10 damage. And his normals are powered up as well, so you can basically um, have 20 damage throws. When you throw and attach an 8 to it, combo an 8 into it, you basically have 20 damage throws for 2 cards. It's crazy. His damage is just so efficient. And looking at his aces, his aces are really, really good. Um, 1.0 speed is a magic speed in this game. Basically, anything that's not a DP, Dragon Punch, is basically loses to Eagle Totem or Trace of Eagle Totem at 1.0. And it's Ender too, so you can hit confirm with it with a normal. So 20 damage Ender, that's 1.0 speed, really good. But we haven't even talked about the other side of the ace, which Beast Unleash, it's a 45 damage super throw. That only costs 3 cards. There's only um, one other super that is that efficient. Uh, that's Grave Super, but we'll get to that later. But Beast Unleash, once he gets two blocks attached, he has access to Beast Unleash, and becomes basically one of the strongest dodge follow-ups in the game. Three aces for 44 damage, doesn't need a lot of resources to do it. It's insane. And his abilities, let's see. Let's take a look. You can see Troc is loaded with abilities, even though his ace doesn't really count, but his abilities are great, like War Stomp, is one of the best card disruption tools in the game. Indo is located on one of his dodges. He only has eight dodges, so he does need to protect them. Um, Warstorm is so good. You, your opponent is knocked down, loses a card, and you draw a card. So it basically gets you a net positive of two cards. Is it? Well, yeah, yeah, exactly. And they're knocked down, so you can basically try to mix up with Warstorm. Um, his J. Troc armor, neither side of his jack can be interrupted by normal attacks. This is a card that he can use basically to stuff um, fast attacks, fast normals, or stuff or beat BBB with, because BBB has access to 1.0 normals. Oh yeah, Zane has access to 1.0 speed normals. So not only is it just really fast, it also beats normals on top of it for some reason. Like, why does he have, why does, why does this ability attached to his jack? And of course, his Lockhorn Skewer, his K, is a carbon copy of Rook's K, which mean, which basically says if it beats normal attacks with speed 5.0 or faster, you still take damage, but you still win and deal 15. Obviously, this is just a really good card for grapplers because it stops the opponent from safely playing um, fast attacks. And 15 damage is just monstrous. It's one of Rook's best cards because he has a K, and it's one of Troc's best cards. In fact, Troc can utilize his K even better because Troc can dodge into it. So, yeah. His abilities, crazy. And uh, what else? Let's look at his overall... And his overall kit, yeah. His overall kit is just, just suits him very, very well. It's just a very efficient, strong kit. Access to many fast throws. Um, a decent number of blocks. All his face cards are really good. It's a common meme that, you know, Troc has, if, a tr if you don't have a, um, all your face cards in your discard as Troc, you're doing something wrong. So, all his face cards are good, fast, decent damage. Um, and yeah, he just has he just has everything, really. Almost everything. I would say Troc's only weakness is that sometimes um, Giant Growth actually becomes a relevant downside when he's faced with a lot of fast attack spam. They can basically contest with his face cards and his aces. It does make Troc's life more annoying dealing with fast attack spam that keeps recurring. But otherwise, you know, Troc can still play around that if he has access to dodges. It's a downside that can be mitigated, basically. Even though Troc does have to worry about that. Because he cannot keep his blocks. He always has to 
discard them or attach them when they are attacked. So yeah, that is why I would create say Troc as a meta defining character because he is a grappler that just just has it all. Like he is very fast for a grappler as well his speeds. So yeah, Troc is just that good. So I will put him in tier S. Moving on, um, we'll save the best for last. Uh, let's put Geiger in tier S. Geiger, where do I start? Um, first of all, he's a 90 HP character, which is you know about basically a, a sort of like a average, above average kind of HP. Um, and his ability time stop, the opponent takes block damage from a time spiral. They can't activate innate abilities from blocking, and you may throw them. So what does that mean? Um, time stop basically gives Geiger, makes Geiger one of the few characters that has attacks that beat block. Only a few characters can do it. Geiger is one of them. So time stop is a great ability because you can play you can play like decent speed attacks like 2.4 speed, 2.0 speeds that beat blocks, and you can knock the opponent down afterwards. It's really nice. Um, but honestly, that's not time stop is just not the craziest innate. Most of his strength lies from his crazy kits, especially one ability in particular. So let's look at his aces first. His aces, uh, what can I say? His aces are one of the best in the game. No other character gets access to 0 0.020 damage ace for only two. And you can pump it further with more aces for a maximum of 40 damage. So four aces for 40, two aces for 20, and 0, 0.0 speed. That is a speed that not many characters can obtain. But 0, 0 speed is basically the fast speed in the game again. It beats everything. So Cycle of Revolution pretty much beats or trades favorably, favorably with almost anything in the game. And Time Spiral Hurricane is 2.0 Ender. Just, you know, it's, it's something that you can hit confirm with because it's Ender. You hit confirm for 20. Or he can use it for his 2.0 speed to beat blocks. It's more niche, but, you know, his aces are insane either way, both sides. Mm. His abilities. We can start. Let's start with his eight because this is a weaker. This is one of his weaker ones. So eight basically is Geiger allows Geiger to basically draw his cards that he wants. Geiger is a character that likes to assemble lots of cards and just blow the opponent up with a maximum hand. So his eight sort of accelerates that further by he can look at the top X card of his deck, rearrange it, and draw one. So it allows him to get all the tools he wants and what he needs with depending on how many spirals are in the discard, he allows him to get the tools he wants to threaten his four ability. Icing on the cake of Geiger. Temporal distortion. Temporal distortion allows Geiger to fetch a jack or queen from discard pile. And it's just an overloaded ability. Not only do you get a jack queen for discard, you basically have access to a super mode where your time spirals are all zero combo points. Linkers. All of them. And they all do plus one damage. And they're all unjokerable. You can the opponent cannot use jokers to stop the damage. It's there's only two things in this game that are unjokerable. And temporal distortion is one of them. It makes Geiger an absolute monster where he can basically threaten attack or throw into a million damage. Or, you know, if, if the opponent tries to play fast attacks, Geiger can just block or play Cycloid. It just creates a really devastating mix-up. Like, such a powerful ability load on his 4 is insane. I think Temporal Distortion might be just one, I think it's the best ability in the game. Period. Because it does so much for, for this character. It's basically the centerpiece of his game plan. And even when he doesn't get a 4, you know, Geiger is, is still pretty efficient. 8 damage throws. Like, he's really good. And his aces are really good. Even outside uh, Temporal Distortion. So, yeah. His overall kits. Uh, average speeds. But his K and Ace are very, very fast. His K is considered one of the best reversals in the game because it knocks down. So he can try to mix up after he plays K and knocks him down. And of course, Ace is at 0 0.0. So yeah, middling speed character with crazy ace and K. And one of the best late games in Yomi, period.
that is why he is meta defining because when you block against when you go block block against Geiger you are losing for the most part um, he does have weaknesses like any character anything with card disruption or can stop it from building effectively or can stop it from getting late game like rush down he might have some trouble with but Geiger still has tools to deal with his weaknesses again like most you see a common trend right like uh characters in S still have tools to deal with their weaknesses and Geiger's no exception you know against people that want to stop him from building Geiger can still power up for aces power up for and maybe ha and also have case in hand to basically stop people from disrupting his uh card build he can play aces in case to basically as reversals to beat um, most of their opponent's offense. So yeah, Geiger, really good. Deserves to be an S. Crazy character. And finally, at last, we have the final, the best for last, Zayn in tier S. So, Zayn, if you're new, to, I think only if you're new to Yomi, you will be unfamiliar how strong Zayn is. But, um, Let's see, let's start with his innate. Shenanigans. Shenanigans, once per turn when you play a combat combo card, reveal two cards on the top of your deck and use up to one of them in your combo. Discard down used cards. So shenanigans, people say it's a blessing or a curse because sometimes Zane can mill cards from shenanigans that are useless to him, but for the most part, it benefits him really greatly because it just gives him a free card to use in a combo. And Zane has one of the most fluent combo options in the game because his trolls are lingers. And you know, he has Q, he has high damaging normals. So almost any card he pulls almost any card he pulls from the top shenanigans, he can have some use. Whether it's from a dodge or attack or throw win. Shenanigans is mostly useful to him. And just gives him more card efficiency in his combos. And when I say efficiency I mean, you know, Spending less to deal more is efficiency. And then that's not even covering the media attacks where all your normals are 1.0 speed when your opponent's knocked down. This is insane. It forces your opponent to basically respect Zane's uh, knockdown game because if you don't respect it, you can get blown up for like 30 plus damage and knock down again. Like you have to... That's the central part of Zane's strength, is media attacks, or the threat of it. The threat of it is just good enough to make your opponents play scared, play DPs, and waste their resources. Um, and Zane has access to a lot of knockdown, actually. Even though his Trolls don't knock down, um, his J knocks down, his Ender, his K knocks down, his Reversal. So Zane does have access to, well, precisely eight ways to knock them down, but that's good enough. Because with shenanigans, he will have access to knockdown. Pretty commonly, actually. Yeah. So that's his innate. He's got two good innates. Oh boy, his aces. Um, well, one side, of it, one side of it is not as unremarkable. 1.2 speed, 19 damage for two aces. It's okay. Sometimes he pulls an ace from shenanigans and he can combo with it. You have 19 damage for one card. It's really good. But, you know, otherwise, that's not what we're talking about aces for. Um, the main part is aces that are just really, really busted is maximum anarchy. Again, it's that accursed speed. You know, the same problem that Geiger has where, you know, how Cyclo is 0, 0.0 and solves everything. Uh, Zane has 0, 0.0 aces too. Except they do 50 damage for all four. Sure. Yeah, like he can't combo it, sure. Um, when he plays it raw, it's a kind of a risk, sure. But having an un basically a fast, almost unbeatable attack, 0, 0.0, for 50 damage, that is half of Rook's life, which is the highest HP character in the game, by the way. Um, it's ridiculous. I do not know why his ace is 0, 0 speed. It doesn't need to. Even if it was 0, 0.0, it would still be good because 50 damage is a lot. But it just makes Zane not only a rushdown character, but also can be a late game monster when he builds up for maximum anarchy. Um, so yeah, that's his ace. His abilities... Um, honestly, his abilities are not... 
most of his strength lies in his innate. His ability is not too bad, but creating destroyer on his four is something you have to watch out for. It's unnecessary. It's unnecessary for him to have it because Zane is just such a strong character already. But um, his four basically forces your opponent to discard their, um, to basically put their hand to the bottom of the deck and draw the same number of cards. Yeah. So basically, it basically destroys setup characters when Zane lands a full combo. Um, it's really good actually in certain matchups. Uh, is and it sort of makes like Zane already already uh, deals with characters that need setup pretty well because Zane has access to so much damage. He has access to so much damage and um, efficiency and a lot of free dodges with shenanigans. That basically, he can disrupt opponent from building. But his four ability just adds on onto that, and so characters that need to find specific cards and build will have a lot of trouble dealing with his four ability. So, yeah, um, good ability in certain matchups, and his K ability Crash Bomb can be interrupted. Um, it's basically a an arm, what you would call an armor move. Um, it basically makes Zane's reversal so kind of quote unquote the fastest in the game. Unless the opponent got counters, but it's pretty much the fastest in the game. But at least there's a risk where if you block his K, he gets knocked down and deals five damage to himself. Oh, and it does five chip as well. So Zane can checkmate opponents in certain situations if they have five or less HP with Crash Bomb. So really good, really good ability overall. Even though it is risky to play K. And his overall kit, I think I kind of already explained it, but. One thing to know is that his two his two normals at two point three speed, that beats most a lot of attacks are two point four, so two point three just neatly undercuts it. It's sort of like a magical speed, makes his two poke really good. He has a throw on his five. Most characters that are not grapplers have throws from seven to ten, but Zane has a throw on his five as well, so makes him dominate throw throw clashes usually. Um. His face cards, you know, his, his Q is okay. Basically, he used to make long, big combos. His J does 9 damage. One combo point ended and knocks down. It's insane. Um, yeah, his, his, basically he has, of course, of course, you know, we can discount his 9 normal as well, which is one of the highest dam damaging normals in the game. Um, only, only normals that, you know, beat that are like 10 normals that grapplers and Onimaru have. So yeah, Zane's kit, while it's not the fastest, he can, you know, try monstrous damage. And he can become very fast with media attacks and his K being, you know, um, uninterruptible. So overall, I would put Zane as a meta-defining character. He has very few... He beat... He's, he's, one, he's infamous for being one of the best... Uh, having the best... One of the best matchups present in the entire game. Because he just has... A lot of ways to handle situations and lots of ways to trend damage. And he can go offense turn one, which not a lot of characters can do. Zane is unpredictable, powerful, can do a lot. So that's why he is in meta fighting at tier S. His only real weakness is that he has only even blocks, which sometimes comes into play. Very rarely, but um, yeah. Overall, Zane just has negligible weakness in terms of his strength. Okay. Uh, finally, yeah, we get to tier A. Uh, maybe I'll be able to go through this a bit faster. I feel like tier S characters need to be elaborated pretty deeply. But when it comes down to the other characters, I can kind of go through them faster. Yeah, let's start with the premier tier A character, Grave. Grave feels like Borderline S. Like Grave is a character that has almost everything, but I feel like he he's sort of like a, a borderline between A and S, I would say. But I feel like he's more he more belongs in A. So looking at Grave, his innates, um, knowing the opponents, when you block an attack, you may reveal a card from your hand. If you combat reveal the next turn, if you win, you you get you can fetch a Q, and if you lose, you get a card. It's a okay innate. I think it's pretty good to help 
actually I think it's a really good it just makes graves blocks really good um, it allows grave to build a hand quickly and allows grave to also fetch his cubes which is 0, 0.0 speed so that's a very important thing to note um, so his innate pretty good it's not one of the best innates but it's pretty good um, his aces okay most of Grave's strength lies in his aces. Um, his aces are his aces are insane. One point oh speed, twelve damage enders, only causing two combo points. He can for the for the first part of his A is one point oh single A. He can basically attach it to any combo. Um, throw he can hit confirm throw into A's for twelve damage and one card. It's uh it's really good. Just makes Grave's damage super efficient. And his other side is his like um, Graves late game burst, 0 .0, 0 0.4 speed, three aces, 45 damage, and his ender. It's insane. It's I think it might even be better. It's probably even better than uh, Trox uh, Super Troll. Like Trox Super Troll cost three aces and 45 damage, but um, Graves is a uh, fast attack, 0 0.4 speed. For Super Trolls, at least the opponent can sort of play around it by just playing any kind of attack to discourage the Grappler from playing Super Trolls Raw. But True Power Storms, on top of being a really fast attack, is just super efficient and does a lot of damage. So yeah, his aces are insane. And you can hit confirm True Power Storms. Um, his abilities. Martial Mastery. Draw two cards, discard a card, and the opponent reveals your hand. This is one of the best abilities in the game. It does it's like simple but super effective because having hand knowledge is such a privilege in this game because you can know what options to play against your opponents or what your opponent's likely to play. Um, so it's just really good for scouting, just for for card draw. It does everything for him on his seven. Only downside is that it's on his fastest throw. So sometimes he needs to not he needs to save his sevens for throws instead of playing for martial mastery. And also Graves is one of the few characters that has a counter. That's special. So only three characters in this game have counters, and Graves is one of them. And his counter is unique where his counters are expensive. He discards a face card and his 10. But it forces the opponent to, to discard their ability that they want to play. Um, some characters, they can just... Yeah, this is a, basically straight up negates abilities when he has, as long as he has a face card. And this does this can stop a lot of characters' game plans, like uh, the character we mentioned about Geiger. Grave can stop that temporal distortion in his tracks with mental toughness. And if Grave builds a big hand, there's not much the opponent can do about it. You know, if Grave has counters and face cards and a big hand, you know they just have to accept that some abilities they just won't be able to play because Grave has his ten. It's really good. Um, and Lightning Trap. Finally, oh, we forgot to cover that. Lightning Trap makes this jack just a really good reveal in combat. 2.4 speed. And we deal block damage with this card, return it to your hand, and your opponent doesn't draw a card from blocking. So basically, allows Grave to deal a bit of chip and recurs his J into his hand and stops the opponent from building. So this is just part of Grave's efficient. Uh, it makes it a really strong early game reveal where your opponent is most likely to block. So J is just really good early game. And, you know, it, it actually even lasts all the way to late game sometimes but yeah it's just a really good tool and helps grave grave is one of the best hand builders and jay helps it with that and his overall kits what can i say really good average speed throws 0.6 speed his, his throws aren't too special well actually yeah that's where his main his main weakness lies i will say that graves attacks are so good like 0, 0.0 Q at 10 damage with single card. It's crazy. His aces are crazy. His K is alright. His J is a good combat reveal. Like his attacks are so good that his trolls are lacking. Um, Grave can realistically only do 19 damage from a throw. Which, you know, 19 damage is still good, but it's not anything uh, crazy. It's not. Some characters have really great throw damage. On the higher end with um, 30 damage or so throws, huge combos from throws, you know, grapplers have really efficient, powerful throws. Uh, Grave does not have that. Grave has to manage his throws well, 
and um, accumulate aces so that his throws become okay, decent. So, yeah, that's why Grave belongs in tier A, I would say, because Grave is like a very footsie-based character that uses powerful attacks to sneak in throws that have decent payoff. Um, he's pretty fair overall, even though two power storms on his aces are bullshit. Okay, that's why Grave is in tier A. He has good matchups as well. Let's move on. Setsuki. Setsuki in tier A, I think is a good place to put her. She's pretty much, I think, I think even better than Grave. I think she's even better than Grave in um, defining tier A, because Setsuki is a character to just really, really complete kit, but still has bad matchups that are very apparent. So yeah, <clears throat> let's start with her innate. Um, her innate speed of the fox. When she start, when she finishes her, when she starts to draw face one or zero cards. She can draw five cards, and she may hit back with a full combo if you dodge an attack or joker this turn. So, speed of fox is one of the best, the best innate in the game, and basically what Setsuki players always uh, go for because that's part of her game plan. Where um, she has six combo points, only seventy HP, but she has a lot of ways to dump her hand, play a lot of combo cards, and basically trend with a full hand every turn if she keeps um, making the opponent guess. So she's pretty much a traditional rushdown character in that respect. Um, Speed of Fox is an amazing ability and compliments her. That's basically her main game plan because if you notice uh, or her overall kit, we can just go to overall kit. A lot of her cards are lowish damage, but do, do okay damage, decent damage when she attaches, pumps cards with it. So she needs Spear the Fox to basically keep her giving fuel and cards for her to cycle through her deck and just add more damage. Setsuki Aces, they're pretty good. Um, 1.0 speed, her 1.0 speed side, you know, it beats a lot of things that are not reversals. Can be pumped for 36 damage, yeah. It's really good actually, her Shuriken Hail. And Surprise Gift is one of her consistent best enders because it's 17 damage for two cards. It's efficient for Setsuki, basically. Um, Setsuki, whenever Setsuki has aces in her hand, um, at least two aces, she can make her combos really hurt. So aces are, um, her Setsuki aces are good because they're a lot of her source of damage. Her abilities. Um, Let's start with Bagatrix. Um, Bagatrix complements her innates, basically gets her the cards that she wants. Um, it's really nice. Um, three non-Joker cards from discard pile. She can fetch any three and put on top of the deck. So basically just let her get her cards that she wants for neck for basically next turn. When she and she can dump with that as well. So Bagatrix basically complements her game plan of playing for Speed of the Fox. And Smoke Bomb is just another way, it's, it's an ability that is a counter, one of the few counters in this game. So that's really good. Discard two cards to counter an ability, and the opponent just discards it. Um, really strong. And usually this counter would not be good on any any random character, but for Setsuki, it's really good. Because Setsuki objective is to basically dump her hand. And Smoke Bomb helps her dump her hand easier. So spending two cards for Smoke Bomb... Not a big deal. In fact, it can even be considered a good thing because she can activate Speed of Fox faster. Her overall kit, um, Nimple Flash. Nimple Flash. 0, 0.0 speed starter. Um, not many, I don't, and it's the only starter in the game that's 0, 0.0 speed. The opponent always has to respect Nimple Flash. And the trap of Nimple Flash will force the opponents to blodge, which opens up Setsuki's throws. So, yeah, you can see how that how well that synergizes with her as a rushdown character. It's her her kit is insane. Fast normals at point two, fast throws at point two, fast face cards. K being such a good ender, both sides as a linker or or an ender. Esper dash uh, kind of exists, but it's good for combos. Um, yeah, her kit is really really good. But why is she in t why is she in tier A? Um, she can suffer from awkward hands that she has to dump out of. Um, she has a very unorthodox play style. 
that does not apply to other characters because other characters would like to block and save cards and accumulate up to 12 cards, you know? Sasuke doesn't want to do that, she wants to dump. So, unintuitive. Um, well, unintu I guess it's intuitive when you know how to play her, but she starts off being unintuitive with her play style. Um, not that high damage with ace without aces. And Sasuke has problems dealing with characters that can threaten, that can contest with her fast attack or fast throws. So basically grapplers and characters with really fast attacks that can trade with her nimple flash well. Those give her a hard time. Yeah, because then Setsuki cannot continue her offense constantly. So yeah, she's basically pretty much a pretty good definition of tier, tier A because she has a troublesome matchups as well as matchups that she can just really roll over. Okay. Mm -mm, arg -arg -arg. There's the fish. Tier A character for sure because Argagarg has and has pretty much one of the best innates in the game. At the end of each turn that you are knocked down, the opponent takes two damage. It's so simple, but it's just so good because any any um combat interaction, any combat reveal that Argagarg isn't yeah, basically any combat reveal that Arg isn't losing, Arg is winning. When you when Arg is winning block block with the opponent, Arg is winning. When he when the opponent clashes with Arg's attack, Arg is usually winning. It's like because Hex will always be a timer for the opponent, ticking down the HP, and basically allows Arg to just sit back, quote unquote sit back, and just play passively and let Hex do most of the work. And that's so yeah, that's his innate. That makes it makes Arg a really strong character. Because of his innate. He's one of the most innate centric characters. But Arc's Aces just complement his innate even more. Um, Bubble Shield. It, it, it's basically, it serves, you know um, how Degray's Ace Dodge basically is a constant threat in their opponent's mind because Degray has a dodge that constantly recurs. Well, Archagarg has a block that constantly recurs that when it's hit, the opponent. Uh, takes four damage from Hex, extra two damage from Hex. Sorry, and the opponent cannot hurt Argagarg until Argagarg gets hit by attack or throw, and he loses Bubble Shield. So Bubble Shield just allows Arg to turtle up super well. The opponent cannot comfortably ever comfortably play attacks into Argagarg because the existence of his Ace Block. And once Arg activates Ace Block, he can snowball with his innate to a victory. It's really, really good. And of course, his other side, Blowfish Spikes, 0 0.2 speed, 16 damage ender. It's really good for the character it's attached to. And, you know, um, it's not the highest damaging ace ender, but 0 0.2 speed is really fast. And 16 damage, you can consider, you can basically treat every Argagard card as plus two damage because he does two damage every turn from his innate. So, um, well, yeah, yeah, basically every Argagarg interaction, you can add just add plus two to it effectively. So, Blowfish Spike is effectively an 18 damage under. Um, Argagarg's throws, look at his overall kit, his throws, um, at point A speed are slow and they only do six damage, but when he wins common of it, it's basically eight damage, right? From Hex. So, he basically, you know, Argagarg, Argagarg's overall kit is, you know, he only has three combo points. Um, yeah, he only has three combo points, and his cards don't do like a ton of damage, but they they really add up with Hex, and it just it basically you know it doesn't he doesn't need high damage when Hex does so much work for him. Every turn that the opponent is not winning combat is a turn they're losing against Archergard. That kind of character is just really good. Um, his abilities: Protective Ward. Locate on his fastest throw. Um, say draw a card. This turn the opponent's attacks and throws are enders that cannot be pumped. This card can be key in certain situations for Argagarg because it just prevents the opponent from doing much damage at all. Allows Arg to make risky plays because they have protective wards stopping the opponent from really blowing him up. 
Archaeologic still has to watch out for big supers because protective war won't stop big supers. Um, and Arc has one of the best counters in the game. Crash and flow. Um, counter ability and a player draws a card. If it was played from hand, put it in the bottom of the deck. So it's a counter that Arc 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 most counters in this game, uh, like Grave and Setsuki's, as mentioned earlier, they need to spend resources for, right? Arc counter costs no cards. I mean, it doesn't cost any additional cards, just as 10. So it's it's just a super free counter. Um, the opponent, the only downside is Crash and Flow is that abilities played from hand are returned to the bottom opponent's deck, so they can still have access to it. It's not discarded, but it's, it's still really good. Our counter is one of the best just because of how efficient it is. Um, but yeah, Argagar really fits tier A very well overall. Um, because Argar's weaknesses, Argar's weaknesses are his lack of comeback potential, and certain characters that basically give him a really hard time. That where hex where hex becomes negligible, or the opponent has a lot of bursts that Arg has to worry about, burst damage. I mean, so yeah. But Arg also beats a lot of characters in this game, um, or goes even a lot of characters in this game pretty handily because he's just a character that's so, so self sufficient, plays simple RPS. And just takes the opponent down with, with Hex. So yeah. Tier A is where he belongs. We're almost halfway. <clears throat> Alright, there's two more characters in Tier A. Maybe you can guess who they are. Let's start with Onimaru. This guy. This guy is a monster. Um, let's preface by saying that. Um, his ability, Guard Crush makes normal attacks unblockable if your normal attacks are equal or lower rank. I mean, if your blocks are equal or lower rank than Onimaru's normal attack, his normal attack straight up beats blocks. So, Geiger is a character that beats blocks. One of the characters that beats blocks, Onimaru is another one of them. It basically makes um, the opponent worry about safely building against Onimaru because Onimaru can, can punish blocks with huge reward. And if your opponent decides to poke Onimaru or you know beat Onimaru's normals, then Onimaru can do multiple lot of things. Onimaru can play fast attacks. Onimaru can dodge and do huge damage. Or Onimaru can just simply block. So it just guard crush just makes this neutral, very trending. And the opponent has to always worry about it. So Onimaru's innate is simple, but it's amazing. Um, let's look at his. Aces. Okay. Onimaru's aces, let's let's face it, Onimaru's aces are not very good. But they serve their purpose. Because 1.0 speed, one damage poke. But they attach to his char what they do is that they attach to his character card and any future face cards you land deal 15, 15 unjokable damage. But he loses aces when the opponent blocks his face cards. So his ace basically just gives Onimaru a fast poke and sort of guarantees him more efficient damage in the future. Um, usually Onimaru does not power up for his aces unless he really wants it wants to. But um, they, kind of, they sort of just complement his, over, his overall kit because it's so strong. Um, some, some characters are very ace-centric in their game plan. Onimaru is not one of them. It's just something that gives him a little extra edge. Martial Law is rarely played, but sometimes you need 20 damage and 1.4 speed, sometimes. Um, his abilities. Uh, General's Armor. Okay. Oh yeah, the thing to note about Onimaru is that all his face cards, all his normal attacks do 10 damage. Plus whatever, plus pumping any card for extra damage. So you notice that Onimaru only has one combo points, because that's because all his cards are single damage, cards that can be pumped. And it makes Onimaru, you would think that as a downside only having one combo point, but actually makes Onimaru extre extremely efficient. With very few cards, he can do a lot of damage. So, basically Onimaru at lower lower high hand size is a threat. You always have to play around that. Mm. Okay, and yeah, so look, his abilities. General's Armor. This attack cannot be interrupted by normal attacks, except those that knock down. 
So the opponent will want to play normal attacks for, for um, reward against Onimaru. But they cannot do that against General's Armor safely. Because General's Armor punishes any normal attack attempts with 15 damage in return. It is basically the attack version of... Um, you can say that you can almost say that's the attack version of Trox K throw or Rook's K throw, where it's like an armor move. Yeah, really good. Draw armor is really good. Um, but Final Authority is the main centerpiece of Onimaru's game plan because Final Authority, if you combat reveal a face card, you may discard a card the same suit as the attack to make this to make it beat all other attacks and have it knocked down. Not only that, Final Authority cannot be countered. It's the only ability in this game that cannot be countered. Like, it's an ability that not only grants his face cards infinite speed and knocks the opponent down, but also cannot be countered. You cannot stop it. If one of decides to beat, to play Final Authority, you cannot stop him. It's insane. It's what makes one of so good as his Final Authority on top of everything else he has. Um... So that's his abilities and his overall kit. Onimaru is a very kit centric, uh, very specialized kit character because Onimaru does have um, slowish speeds, like 0 0.8, 0 0.8 speed DP is slow for DPs. His face cards notably look slow. His fast normals on his three, but Onimaru has lost stuff in his kit to mitigate his slow speeds. His general's armor and his final authority, which makes his face cards unbeatable. So that just, just basically makes Onimaru um, a slowish character of efficient damage early on and a very fast um, late game efficient character when he has uh, 12 cards, when he has a lot of cards, yeah. So Onimaru almost does it all. The only glaring weakness of Onimaru is that his throws, they're okay damage. But they cannot combo, and they only have they only give plus four for each card you pump to the com for the to the throw. Oh, and most notably, throws don't knock down. So this creates very problematic matchups for Onimaru, like Argagarg and the Gray, which have a recurring super throw. I mean, super dodge or super block that Onimaru can guard crush or beat with his attacks. Basically, Onimaru in general just cannot handle dodges well because Onimaru's attacks are so strong, and his throws are so. Mediocre in comparison. And they don't knock down. That's probably a big part of it. Um, so yeah, Onimaru is definitely a tier character in that respect. You know, I would say Onimaru would be S tier if Argagarg and the Grey did not exist. So they do, so that's why he's in A. Okay. One more character in tier A. And that last character. Dun dun dun! Can you guess? Lum, the gambling panda. What makes Lum so good? Um, well, okay. I I will confess I am not a good Lum player at all. Um, I only seen people play Lum. I hardly play Lum except in casuals where I suck at Lum. But let's uh let's take a look. Um, his innate is a lot of text, but basically means to be. To summarize his innate, draw a card from the top of your deck after you deal damage or block damage, and do stuff. And most of his stuff, and roll the dice, um, basically allows him to recur his face cards. So his innate is really good in recurring his fast face cards. When he hits with Q, J or K, or deals block damage with J and K, he can roll the dice. If he gets a 4 or 10, he can recur it. So it allows, allows Lum to basically spam fast options and recur it and protect his hand. You know, so Lum plays a very strong attack block range because Lum has one of the best end games in Yomi. Um, so yeah, that's why his innate does along with a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, his aces. Uh, he aces do so much for Lum. It's insane. So we can look at his aces. All sides of his ace are good. His blackjack gives him an unjokerable ace dodge. When you dodge an attacker joker, you instead don't hit back, but instead discard cross from your deck until they deal more than 21 or you decide to stop. 
deal that damage, deal that much damage. So basically, he plays blackjack. Okay, he plays blackjack for his ace dodge, and it's unjokeable damage. So your opponent always has to respect it. Usually, it's one of the few. It's like it's one of the few dodges where, you know, your opponent. The thing about dodges in this game is that if you have a joker in hand, you can always just play your fast attack. Don't have to think about it. Play your fast attack, and if your opponent dodges, then you can just joker the damage. Blackjack does not allow this at all. Blackjack is unjokerable damage from his dodges. Yeah. So, and his attack side. <sighs> Why does he have his attack side? I don't know. But you have to, 0 0.8 is not the fastest a super, I will say. But it's 21 damage for two aces, and he can pump aces on top of it. All four for 45. That's literally more than Cycloid Revolution. If you, if you pump all four aces into it. And it's 0 0.8 speed. Like, he doesn't need he doesn't need Great Pandemonium on top of the stuff, fast stuff he has. But he has Great Pandemonium for some reason. Um, and aces, a third use of aces that is not mentioned on this card is, I'll go into the ability, his 10. So his 10 ability is what makes Lum's late game so powerful. Because... He creates a poker hand with the top two cards of his discard and, top, and three cards from the hand. And consult the chart to do stuff. Um, so Lum is very much a hand crafter. And, but the, he wants to play for blackjack a lot. But I mean poker flourish. And the best way to use poker flourish is four of, use, uh, use match of four of a kind cards for blackjack effect. Where you basically, it's the same, it's the same as his ace dodge. Where the blackjack effect is you he discards top cards from top of his deck and deals up to 21. Um, so he plays for four of a kind a lot. So the easiest way to play for four of a kind uh, is to power off for aces. You put aces in discard, have aces in your hand, you can create a four of a kind easily with Poker Flourish. So Poker Flourish is card intensive, is a pretty card intensive um, ability sometimes, but um, it's really, really strong. And it's, it's Lum's. Lum's a recurring team of Lum is unjokable damage. Damage that out of combat cannot be stopped. And his ten ability does a lot of things, but four of a kind is what you need to worry about. And jackpot on his seven. If you and you basically draw a card, reveals a card from random from an opponent's hand. If it's ace, they take seven damage. And if it's joker, you take two, just because, uh, just for the memes. Um, <laughs> jackpot is again more unavoidable damage the opponent has to worry about because the opponent basically means that the opponent is trying to fight against you late game with aces Lump can play jackpot to randomly do 7 damage sometimes and also give give himself hand info and also allows him to cycle through his deck too because he draws a card after playing jackpot uh, yeah jackpot is crazy as well as poke flourish so his ability is really good his overall kit um, strong. Um, rolling panda is one of the best. Rever uh, no, I wouldn't say one of the best. I mean, actually, it is one of the best. The fact that it can recur when it hits the opponent is one of the, makes it one of the best reversals. Zero point four speed, recurring super, recurring reversal that can do sixteen damage with two Qs. Um, really good. Coin toss is just a good poke. Low damage, but a good poke. K. Is a decent ender sometimes. Mm. Lum has a six throw for whatever reason. So if you try to disrupt Lum with throws, you can play his six throw to counter throw you. And not only beats your blocks, but beats most of your throws probably. And only downside of his overall kit and why Lum is in A tier is that his throw damage sucks. Other than extra juice. But extra juice still sucks. Um, but yeah, Lum's, Lum throws suck because it is even worse than Onimaru throws. Onimaru throws, they deal f 4 damage for every card pumped. But Lum's throws are even less efficient, only plus 3 damage with exception extra juice. So Lum's throws suck and they don't knock down and they're not efficient. Um, aside from that, Lum also doesn't have a 2 normal, so you can exploit that by playing a 2 normals to undercut his normals. So Lum has. Suffers the similar weakness of Onimaru. I like the they're like they can you can basically consider them as best buddies because they share the same weaknesses of the gray and Argagar existing. 
And the great arc is this thing is why they're both trapped in A tier. If these two characters did not exist, if the great arc didn't exist, they could potentially be S tier characters just because they both have powerful late games, but they both have crappy throws. So birds of a feather, I would say. And that's it for A tier. Um, let's move on to tier B. Capable characters, but has weaknesses. And boy, does Yomi have a lot of char capable characters, but have more obvious weaknesses than tier A, and of course tier S with almost no weaknesses. Okay, let's start. Valerie. Valerie in tier B. Well, well let's um, just a brief overview. Why is she capable? Because Valerie can be very fast. Um, Trend with a lot of fast options. Has one of the most insane combo damage in the game. But her weaknesses, she needs to build to get there. And she loses to even faster attacks, most notably reversals. So let's go, let's go look at Valerie. Her innate, you can combo normal attacks in any order. It's simple, but it's a good innate because it allows Valerie to string together very high damaging combos from random normals and she can grab aces from it. So it's a big part of her, her innate is a big part of her game plan. Um, it's really good. And she has six combo points on top of that as well. So basically the highest like highest combo potential other than Setsuki and Gwen. Yeah, those are the only two with six combo points. Um, her ace, really nice. When you hit either side ace, you draw a card. So Chromatic Orb at 1.0 can combo. It's one of the best pokes in the game because it beats anything that's not a reversal. By the way, when I say reversal, in case you guys didn't know, reversal is sub 1.0 speed attack. So attack smash at 1.0. So Chromatic Orb beats anything that's not a reversal and she draws a card from it. And Masterpiece is one of her best uh, damage conversion. 16 damage for two aces, 1.2 speed ender. Um, and also to draw a card as well, either side. So just basically, Valerie is very card hungry and their aces remedy that somewhat. They help her do, they do good damage and they get her cards. So her aces are good and they're easy to get from because of her innate. So it also synergizes very well for game plan. Her abilities, she has a lot of them actually, what the hell? She has four abilities. Let's start with bold strokes. After combat reveal, she can play bold strokes to make her normal attacks do plus one damage each turn and draw a card. Simple ability. It's really nice to have. Um, sometimes it's good for Zal. It's, it's located on her fastest throw, 7.2 speed. It's a crazy fast throw. Um, sometimes Valerie does, wants to save that as a throw instead of his ability, but it's also a good ability to have and play when she has a lot of normals that she can combo with. Get her a lot of reward. And sometimes the extra card draw from 7 allows her to uh, get her extra normal for her straight. So it's an ability that does a lot of things for her. It's nice. It's nice to have. But a key ability is her burst of speed on her 10. Conveniently located on her slowest throw. It basically means it's another combat reveal ability. Any attack or throw you can't reveal is 2 speed faster when you play burst of speed to a minimum of 1.0. So it basically makes Valerie's normals beat any makes Valerie's um a lot of Valerie's attacks beat anything that's not a reversal. 1.0 speed is a very key speed and beats a lot of things. And so Valerie can speed up her normals that are already fast at 0.4 speed to 1.0 and makes her string together huge combos. That's her main part of her strength. Um her last ability, I think I already mentioned it, is her last ability is splash of color on her K. This can only be blocked by a block of the same color. So red Ks beat black blocks, and black Ks beat red blocks. It's sort of a filler ability, but it's relevant in certain matchups, where you can try in a really fast K with burst of speed, and your opponent just has to block correctly, or else they lose. Um, it's, yeah, it can be, this card can be relevant. It's pretty good. It's nice of her to have to open up the opponent. Um, yeah, and her overall kits, 
I would say our overall kit, the good speeds. Um, J, it's important to note that J is our main source of damage, um, except for aces, because J is a seven, is a seven damage ender that can be pumped to 21 damage for two combo points. But she needs faces for it. So Valerie is kind of a car, uh, hand builder in a way where she needs to build up faces to try and really strong damage. Um, so her Q and K, she doesn't like to play that in combat that much because she would like to feed it into her J for damage. Um, so her overall kit is just focused, her focusing on grabbing aces and grabbing faces. Mm, but the main problem with her kit is that well, she only has 80 HP, first of all. And her throws only do 6 damage at our 3 combo points. So her throws are not good without reward. Our throws are, yeah, they're fast, but they have really lame reward unless she has faces or aces. So Valerie is pretty much, she has no way to accelerate her hand building other than normal draw, blocking, aces. So Valerie is like a awkward rush down where she needs to burst the opponent down and sometimes build. So your opponent can also exploit that because she's only 80 HP. Furthermore, Valerie is weak. Her why she's in tier B, she is weak to reversals, and almost all characters in this game have a reversal. Reversal is, is sub 1.0 speed attacks. So Valerie basically has to respect reversals at all times because they just stop her offense dead cold. Um, she does have her own reversal at 0 0.2 speed on her Q, but that reversal is not very good. Low damage and not efficient in terms of damage, yeah. So, yeah. that. But overall, Valerie has a lot of potential and just needs to play around awkward hands and awkward hand building sometimes. But she does a lot of damage. She can be really good. Moving on. Jaina! Jaina! People thought Jaina was really bad at first. Some people thought she was one of the worst characters in the game, but I think a lot of people have opened their eyes and realized, hey, maybe this character ain't so bad. And she ain't so bad. Jaina is a character... I love her innate. Um, in case you didn't know, I'm biased Jaina main. Um, Jaina, Burning Vigor. At the end of combat, if you attack, you may return any of your combo cards to your hand other than Queen's or Aces and take 3 damage for each card returned this way. And the second part, if you have 35 or less life, you may return Queen's Aces for 4 damage. So, the main strength for Jaina is recurring fast, recurring, well, not fast, unless Aces are Qs, but yeah, recurring decently speed attacks that she can keep buying back for at the cost of her own life. Well, it seems that 3 damage is a lot, but um, in reality, it just gives Jaina... It just it just always almost always worth it to buy back because it gives Jaina a full hand and basically trends Jaina can snowball the opponents in a way that she can keep playing attacks, winning combat with it sometimes, getting them back, and just always has a full hand that your opponent has to respect. So that's the main strength for Jaina. And that's her innate basically um Yeah, her innate basically is 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 the main part of her game plan. She relies on her innate to keep trending the opponent with a Big damaging hand. Her aces. Um, her aces are all right. I wouldn't say her aces are the best, but they're serviceable, and a big part of her game plan late game, where when she has thirty five or less HP, thirty five or less HP, she can bind them back for four health each. So, one the the one side that's commonly played is red dragon. It's a can combo move that can pump up the three aces for it. So it's 10 damage poke, 0 0.8 speed. That's a reversal. Um, and it can go up to 37 damage. It's really good. Um, she needs to accumulate aces for it, but Jaina can get aces easily. And she can buy them back late game. Her other side, her 0 0.2 speed ender is 18 damage. This is her main meat of her, meat of her combos, where she can trend crazy combo damage when she has two aces with letter J. 18 damage ender is not so high, but Jane has five combo points. Um, and the 0 0.2 speed is actually relevant in certain matchups. So it's really good. 
uh, her abilities. I am not a big fan of unstable power on her seven. Unstable power basically um, knock the knock down opponent's stand up. You can't play aces this turn, but you can rotate your combat reveal attack 180 degrees. If you hit the opponent this combat, search your deck or discard power for two aces. Otherwise, take seven damage. It's risky. It's a really risky ability, and it's located on our fastest throw. But it has high reward because if you win combat with Unstable Power, you get two aces, and Unstable Power can also try and, uh, can also be used for late game checkmate situations. But that's kind of advanced tech. Um, Unstable Power, I don't like playing it, but it can be good. It can be good sometimes, yeah. Mm. I would much rather use it for a throw. Um, and her 10, Smoldering Embers, is a big part of her game plan. I like this ability a lot. Whenever your opponent dodges while discards, discard pile to take 2 damage. But you can't power up with the 10. So basically, Smoldering Embers on her 10 basically gives her a really easy block or throw to use. Because you, if your opponent decides to beat the, the block by throwing, then you know it's not a big deal. Your 10 is sent to your discard. And where you can continue hurting the opponent for the rest of the game whenever they try to dodge. And it can also be used as fodder for um, her Q, where she pumps, or her knee bash, where she can pump extra cards into it. 10 is basically the ideal, perfect card to pump those attacks with, or knee bash with. And Smoldering Embers, while 2 damage doesn't seem like a lot, late game it will really matter, because Jaina's game plan is all about checkmating the opponent with fast attacks late game with the aid of Smoldering Embers because she does a lot of chip. You notice from her kits. We can also go, go to her kit immediately. You notice that her kit does a lot of chip. Her normals do chip. And Smoldering Embers plays in that perfectly because the opponent takes damage even when they dodge. So Jaina's overall kit, with she has average speeds, average throw speed, um, but she has really fast 0.2 speed reversals on her Q and her A. So she is a character that has middling speeds but has some really fast explosive stuff. And late game, they become a big factor, especially with Burning Desperation, because she can buy her fast stuff back. So your opponent has to really, really, really worry about Jaina's late game and has to make sure that they don't, they don't die to Jaina just chipping you out or basically forcing you to a checkmate situation where you cannot attack, you cannot block or dodge, you die. Yeah, so that's Jaina's really main strength is her. She has good neutral as well, decent neutral. Her only main weakness and why she's in B, well, two main weaknesses rather, is that unfortunately she only has four blocks. Um, she has a lot of dodges, which is nice. Um, but honestly, Jaina needs like maybe one more rank of block to have a stable hand because sometimes. Jaina hands can be locked into too many attacks and dodges and not enough good throws or blocks. So you, feel, you might feel restricted to one option as Jaina. That is a problem. And her other weakness is that Jaina loses hard to 0.0 speed attacks. So it does create some matchup problems where they have 0.0 speed they have to worry around. Because Jaina likes the inevitability of her, her late game. And her inevitability is ruined when your opponent has 0.0 speed attacks that can burst her down. So aces and queens losing to 0.0 attacks, big no-no for her. And that's why she's in B tier. Her strengths are her strengths are apparent, and her weaknesses are apparent as well. Okay, moving on. Uh, there's four more characters in B tier. Let's go with Gloria next. Gloria, hmm. Gloria's hard to judge. Some people think that she's really bad. Some people think that she's a lot better than people give her credit for. And I think, yeah, I think B tier is where she belongs. Even though that's debatable. You can argue with me on that. Um, Gloria. Let's just, hard character to break down, so let's look at her innate. Healing Touch. After power up phase, if you are knocked down, you may discard two non-hard cards to gain four life and fetch a hard card from her discard pile. Um, healing Touch is what makes Gloria so um, so good because she only starts out with 70 HP, but she can she effectively has a lot more HP than 70 because every turn she has a potential to heal back 4 life 
and grab a heart card from this card. So heart cards are very important for her. Allows her to basically recur back um, her good options. Mm, her options that she wants, she she can rec recur back with healing touch. So it's not just healing, it's also getting her options. Key ability. Um, so her ace is cent central to Gloria's game plan. Um, both sides of the aces are pretty good. 0 0.6 speed starter, that's 29 damage for three aces. That's pretty good, it allows for high damage combos. Twilight Key is a pretty devastating linker at 2.0. Um, she could just tack onto anything for 18 damage extra. But the main use of, of Gloria's aces is overdose. Both players take 10 damage, you first, but if you want combat, draw two cards. So this allows Gloria to basically snowball to a win because both you and the opponent take 10 damage, but you're the only one that's drawing cards and accelerating your game plan. And you're also the only character that can heal other than the gray. But so, yeah, so Gloria can basically heal up the damage she's taken from overdose while the opponent takes the full brunt of the overdose and she gains cards from it. So it's really it's a really good ability that allows Gloria to accelerate the 2D endgame as fast as possible. Gloria is all about winning RPS and overdosing and forcing the opponent into a very, very bad situation where the game's ending faster than it wanted to. She's a very unique character in that regard when she speeds up the game like that. Um, her abilities. Mm, healing Sphere. I can't stress enough how strong Healing Sphere is. Um, at the end of each turn, draw a card if you heal. And discard this if you were if you did not heal or were thrown. So with proper hand management, Healing Sphere basically gives Gloria a really consistent, um, reliable card engine that basically allows her to give her resources to heal, to you know, her dam more damage, just more options, more cards. So just it just it does everything for Gloria because Gloria doesn't really have any access to card draw other than overdose and healing sphere. Those two are the only two abilities that she has that um, gets her cards, and she wants a lot of cards. Gloria's kind of card hungry. She wants to get to her heart cards, and yeah, healing sphere is really good. Um, your opponent, you can you can snowball wins with healing sphere set up, and your opponent has to play around it by throwing her. Um, what's her other ability? Yeah, Bave and Moonlight on her J. If you hit with either side of this jack, you return to your hand to heal yourself and your opponent for 4 life. So at first you might see this ability and be like, wow, that kind of sucks. Um, he, it, basically makes, it, makes, it basically makes Moonlight Sphere do only 1 damage. Your opponent heals up most of the damage. It sucks. But no, no, it's actually really good because it recurs to Gloria's hand and triggers Healing Sphere. And not to mention, it's a heal for herself as well. So, J basically allows her to, and you know, the and plus the end of combat uh, option of for J is purely optional. So, you can also use J basically to, um, having a annoying. Not only do you have a recurring two point two speed poke, but um, you can use to activate overdose when you win combat, and just keep on um, trending the opponent with overdoses and healing yourself and triggering healing sphere because of uh, bathe and moonlight so yeah jay is just a really good poke and a decent source of damage when you need to um yeah it's ability it's really good ability it's kind of similar to um graves jay in that regard where they're both recurring jay attacks but glorious is more is stronger um what else? Oh yeah, so her overall kit. Gloria is kind of a weird character where her normals are 0.8 speed, her throws are 0.8 speed, so her normals are all slow, and her throws are slow, but her face cards are very fast. 2.2, 2.2, 1.0 speed. Um, they're very fast, and she can recur them when they're, heart, when they're a face of hearts. So really good. Um, her kit overall kind of complements her really well. Um, 
she's so so basically she's good against characters that uh, want to assemble late game but cannot assemble late game in time due to Gloria accelerating the game. And also she's good against characters that cannot do much damage to her, like Argagarg. Yeah. Gloria is considered one of Argagarg's worst matchups, by the way. Um But her weaknesses basically are um she dies pretty hard to burst damage because overdose hurts her as well. So burst damage is a problem for Gloria. And another problem for Gloria is that she can be very reliant on certain cards to win. Um, hand variance is a big problem for Gloria because she needs certain hearts to keep recurring. And she needs healing spheres. And she doesn't get that, it can be hard for her. Mm, yeah, so variance and burst damage are the two, thing, two main weaknesses that Gloria has. But otherwise, her kit is very good. She has a very solid... Um, game plan of healing and drawing cards. So yeah, B tier. Okay, there's three more cards in B tier. Let's start with Quince. Quince. I used to think now this is a character that I used to over overestimate and think that he could handle everything. But then the more I play him and the more I play against some good characters and people that figured out Quince, the more I realize okay this character has Pretty big flaws that would put him in B, but has really great strengths as well. So Quince, um, positive spin. At the end of the turn, if you dealt damage or block damage, you may reveal a face card from your hand. If you can't reveal that card next turn, you may draw a card to rotate it 180 degrees. So this ability, so Quince is a very weird vortex character, where if Quince lands a successful hit, he can basically spin one of his, he can show one of his face cards and activates the ability to spin it. So his face cards create interesting 50-50s where, you know, his J-spin, you beat it by blocking. His Q-spin, you beat it by attacking. His K-spin, you beat it by throwing a, with a throw faster than 9.0 speed. So it creates 50-50s for the opponent where Quince can either play the spin card honestly or um, he can lie and not play his, uh, and play the option that beats the option that you're trying to beat the spin with, if that makes sense. <laughs> okay, so that's his innate. His innate is basically um, his main vortex. Quince is a really is a vortex character that any hit he gets allows him to start his vortex. His aces. Um, Quince's aces are amazing. They are slow, yes, but we can look at that. One side of it is Patriot Mirror. 2.8 speed is considered very slow. But if he deals damage or block damage, he can um, activate Patriot Mirror next turn where you play two cards face down and your opponent has to, and you can basically choose one to play and discard the other. So basically it allows Quince to try in a very ambiguous mix-up when he hits with Patriot Mirror. Your opponent has to guess what two cards you face down and play around it. And it's doubly strong when your opponent is knocked down. Which Patriot Mirror also, yeah knocks the opponent down. So it was a really good um, really good dodge follow-up as well. So Patriot Mirror um, is a really important source of mix-up for Quince. It's card-hungry, but it makes the opponent f forced to guess um, what two cards you play and allows him to continue his mix-ups even further. And his other side, Consanity Governed at 1.2 speed, it's a really, it's a really efficient ender when he has three aces. Uh, 1.2 speed is okay. It's actually 1.2 speed is actually fast, the fastest speed for Quince, and it's basically 1.2 speed is the standard speed for Ace Enders. And if he has a third Ace, it does 30 damage for three cards, three Aces. It's really good. Um, Crystal Cover is nice for late game Quince when he needs damage conversion. So yeah, both sides of the Ace are, are great. Aces are part of his game plan. Um, his abilities. Let's start with Flagstone Tax. Um, Flagstone Tax is similar to the Gray's Troublesome Rhetoric, where you basically call an op a combat option, and if your opponent plays the option, Quince draws two cards. So this this card, Flagstone Tax, a lot of people underrate it, but I find it really good because it basically um, protects your spins in a way that you can tax the, the option that will beat a spin card that you have. And your opponent kind of has to restrict the spin even more because 
if they try to beat your spin, then you know you draw three cards straight up because you rotate your spin card and you draw two cards from attacks. So your opponent basically gives you three cards if they want to beat the spin. And flax attacks also allows you to be more more efficient with your um, mix-ups because it allows dodges to pay for itself. It allows you to regain cards that you would spend. It's a really good ability overall. Um, and he Quince is a, it synergizes with him really well. Quince needs Flagstone Tax to make his mix-ups more even more threatening. But that's not even his best ability. His best ability is on his two. Two troops. Choose out the three cards from your discard pile. And reveal the top two cards. And you arrange those in two different piles. So what this does, two troops does, is... It's basically the main source of Quince's draw engine, other than his faces and his tent. It allows Quince to get get back so many cards. You spend two troops and you can get two or three cards back of great value. Because and basically what your opponent you can force the opponent to basically choose between uh you basically try to create a loose loose situation where you try to create two piles of really good cards. Um maybe two high value cards and three semi val medium value cards and the opponent has to choose which one to give to you. So this can create really interesting mind games and also a really good way for you to get cards back. Quince needs two troops um, to basically keep his card hungry uh, vortex going. So yeah, very important ability that he has. This overall kit this overall kit ties into his main weakness and why he's in B tier is that Quince is slow. He has 0.8 speed normals and his 2 normal is basically unplayable because you need it for 2 troops. So basically he's really slow. His fastest attack is 2.6 when he doesn't have aces, when he doesn't have consent to govern. His trolls are also very slow at 0.8 speed and you know, standard trolls 7 to 10. So. That's his main. That's his main weakness, honestly. Is that he's very, very slow. But because of his innate positive spin, it gives him very, very strong reward when he wins combat. So he creates Quince forces pressure on, on like any other on the opponents. Whoops, where the opponent has to respect almost any option from Quince, and Quince has access to a lot of common options in his kits because his face cards uniquely have two different common options on each side. So he doesn't have to just play them for spin, he can play them as a combat reveal as well. Like K-dodge and NJ-dodge is very important. Gives him two extra ranks of dodges other than his 3 and 4. So Quince can threaten a lot of options in a combat triangle despite being slow. And has high value when he wins combat because of positive spin. Yeah, and it's one of the best, straight up one of the best mix-ups in the game. One of the best vortexes in the game. Vortexes is basically what you would call like advantage time for a certain character. And Quince has the best advantage time in the game because any hit triggers it and it forces the opponent to 50-50s or even worse when he lands Patriot Mirror. But being, being a very slow character is a very obvious flaw. And also Quince having no DPs, basically no attacks faster than 1.0, makes him very vulnerable when he's knocked down. Very, very vulnerable. And that's problematic in certain matchups. So, yeah. That is the main weaknesses of Quince. But he has very good strengths as well. So that's why he's in B. Wow, almost done with B. Let's go to... Menalker. Menalker is a character... <sighs> I almost have to put in C. But I feel like B is a better place for him. I just think Menalka is... People used to think that Menalka is really good and that he has really high damage potential and just really um, and strong hand disruption. So they thought he was an amazing character. But he has he has pretty big flaws. I don't know, I will explain why. I think B is a good place for him. Let's start with his innates. Bleeding Wounds. When you hit the opponent with a black face card attack, even during a combo, Draw a card and they discard a card. Through the power of phase, you have power for black face cards. It's a really good innate because it allows Menalker to disrupt the opponent's hand 
and feel his own damage because a lot of his cards um, can be pumped with additional cards for more damage. So black face cards basically feel that by giving him card draw when he hit confirms with a black face and makes the opponent lose cards. So Milker can stack black face cards and make the opponent have a bad day with a small hand. Um, and of course the second part of it is important too. Being able to power up for any black face card gives him a basically makes him like a Swiss army knife where he can get the tool he wants whenever he wants when he powers up. Mm, yeah. His ace. His aces are some of the best in the game, I would say, actually. That is one big upside for Minolka as well, is that his aces are amazing. Um, though the attack side of his ace, at 1.2 speed, it kind of leaves some much to be desired in that respect. It would be not going to be a lot better character if his attack side was 1.0. 1.2 speed is still decent, but his ace attack is basically the main source for his damage, his combo enders, because it does 22 damage for two combo points. That's insane. Um, only requires two aces as well. It can be pumped, so very versatile attack side. Can be used as a poke in a pinch as well. But his tro side is one makes his aces super appealing because Death Strike Dragon is the highest damaging super in the game. Yep. I mean, that's partially why some people look at Nelker and wonder how he can be bad because he has a 55 damage super throw. 4.6 is an okay speed. It's worse than Grappler super throws in speed, but it beats pretty much any other throw that are non grappler in the game. So Death Strike Dragon is a really powerful 55 damage throw super that the opponent has to really worry about late game. Um, yeah, both sides of aces have their own utility and purpose, and they're both good. His abilities. <clears throat> two of his abilities. He only has two abilities, actually. For some reason, I thought he had more. But yeah, he only has two abilities. Um, we start off with Bonecracker. Bonecracker is a really, really key ability for Menalker. When you win, when you throw the opponent with this card, they reveal their hand and discard a card of your choice. It's a simple ability, but it's really effective and forces the opponent to respect it. His 7. The less you play the 7, the more trending it becomes because the opponent always has to worry about it in the back of their mind that he's going to look at my hand and discard my best option. So it's what makes Menalker's otherwise lackluster throws trending because Bonecracker exists. And of course, you can dodge into Bonecracker or you can just play raw. You just have to win combat out of it, which can be harder than it seems, but um, it's a really good ability if you win combat out of it. And his other ability on his 10 is uh, it's a it's an ability that seems amazing at first. Banish a card from the opponent's discard pile. They must then banish another card of the same rank from the hand or their deck. So you look at this and think, wow, that's amazing. You can basically remove tools from the opponent forever. But unfortunately for Into Oblivion, um, they can discard cards from the deck as well. So they don't have to hurt the hand when you play Into Oblivion. And also, um, Into Oblivion also, also, when you play Into Oblivion, you don't get cards of your own. So you're spending a card to remove opponent's options without getting any of your cards back. So the best way to play into Oblivion, it's like a really hard to use ability, but can pay off, is the best time to use into Oblivion is when you can force cards out of your opponent's hand. So basically you spend a card to get rid of their good options from their hand. And you can also use into Oblivion as the best way for Minolka to banish jokers completely, because jokers are annoying to deal with because they can burst away your combo damage. But Minalker can disregard that with Into Oblivion, which is really nice. Once the opponent has played a Joker and is in their discard pile, they can use Into Oblivion to remove the second one, and you don't have to worry about it anymore. So that's his, so basically like, so he seems like a really good character, right? Like he has hand disruption with his innate, his seven throw, his tens removing the best tools. But what makes Minalker struggle sometimes. Minalker suffers a lot from card variance. And you know, you see me using that term a lot 
but Melker, it's a big part of Melker's um, downside is that only half of his faces cards are good. His red face cards are not very good at all because they're so card intensive to use. Like his his K six damage only two point two speed six damage plus five per attached card. It's not. It's like it can do sixteen damage, which is great, but it's expensive. And if the if the K is not a black K, it's not. It doesn't pay for itself very well. Um, so red face cards are not good, and sometimes Melka's hand can be really bad, and he has to block. And okay, look look at this. Look at this life total. Seventy life. He's a character that needs build up. And needs to block. Plays for late game usually. He usually plays for Melka usually plays for a devastating late game. But he only has 70 HP to do so. He has the lowest HP in this game. And other characters that have rushed down are about that that other characters that have like similarly low HP, um, they at least have really good rushdown tools. But Melka doesn't really have that, except for I would say, except for his Q. Luckily, Monocular has his black Q that he can power up for his innate. 0, 0.0 speed, 8 damage, can be pumped. It can be good for warding off opponents because black Q not only beats almost anything in the game, since 0, 0.0, fastest speed, um, it can also force your opponent to discard a card when you play it, and it hits. So your opponent has to respect that. And so Monocular can use the trial black Q to help build his hand. But yeah, Melka is a very delicate character. Can be very explosive. Can be very unfun to play against because he robs your robs you of options. But Melka has pretty glaring weaknesses as well. Primarily being a seventy HP character that needs to build build cards. Um, so Melka can be run over pretty hard sometimes. But you can also run the opponent over with enough black face cards. Okay, so yeah, he's a B tier character. It makes sense to win there. Let's move on to the final BT character. Some people may disagree with me on this. Um, but I would consider Midori B tier. Why? Because Midori has the tools. If Chalk is a premier grappler, then Midori is all okay. so is um yeah, how do you say this? If Chalk is a premier grappler, then Midori does grappling pretty alright because they do have some parallels, which I will go into later. Um, Midori has the eight damage. Actually, let me say it now. Midori has the eight damage throws like Troc. Midori has similar combo potential to Troc. Has eight eight damage normals. Can make six, seven, eight straights. Um, Midori has dodges, two ranks of dodges, so he can dodge and do efficient damage. So he's like a Midori is kind of like a mini Troc in a way. And that, that's good enough, honestly, to put in B. So let's just go into his innates. Master Midori. Well, um, Aspect of the Dragon basically gives him access to dragon attacks that cannot be dodged with normal dodges. And in dragon form, when you block an attack or joker, you can search any card from your discard that's not a joker and put it in your hand instead of drawing. And of course, Midori has defense mastery like any other grappler. So his innate is really strong. Um, Edo is pretty much dependent. It's very ability dependent. Um, when he has access to dragon form, he becomes one of the strongest characters in the game. Period. Um, dragon form is really, really scary to play against. And Midori can keep threatening his powerful tools with Aspect of the Dragon, where he can recur his tools back even after he's played them. Um, his aces. Midori's aces are pretty good. 1.2 speed, 20 damage, and there is simple. Simple and good. Um, can you can hit confirm of it. It's an important source of damage for Midori. And won't Midori has speed problems. Ace attack kind of resolves that. But his other side, final dragon buster, is a 20 damage throw that can be pumped to 52 damage with four aces. That is crazy. It basically gives him, with three aces, it does 36 damage. It gives him like a, it's a blessing and a curse because 
your opponent can it's possible for your opponent to be to blue burst the additional damage. Like the opponent can Joker that 32 extra damage if he pumps aces. But you know, it makes it makes his ace throw always trending. Because it's either gonna be 20 damage or even more when he has more aces in his hand. 52 damage is something you have to respect. Um Foul Dragon Buster is really amazing and why part of the reason why I play Midori is for a Final Dragon Buster. Um, yeah, aces are good. His abilities. Dragon Form. It's a simple ability that triggers his innate. But basically, you play in the draw phase and you become a dragon. And you can now play dragon moves. And you, you lose Dragon Form if you get thrown or if you come out of a non-dragon attack or throw. So this ability... Sort of like Geiger's, um, sort of like Geiger's temporal distortion, where it's his main game plan, kind of. But um, yeah, Midori plays with Dragon Form a lot, and when he gets it and has a big hand of Dragon cards, um, you become another, a whole new character. You're really, really, your attacks are undodgeable. Your opponent has to respect them. Your opponent tries to beat you with fast attacks. You can block to get your options back. Um, yeah, and. The only way to beat Dragon Form is to throw him. And throwing a Grappler is some of the scariest thing to do. Especially when the Grappler has explosive damage in Dragon Form. So yeah. Amazing ability. And Midori needs this to. To really function uh, at full power. And ability on this 10. Glimpse of the Dragon. Combat reveal a face card while not in Dragon Form. You can rotate 180 degrees through to the Dragon version of your move. He cannot do with aces. So this ability gives him like a mini dragon form that he can use in combat in the pinch. Um, it's not, obviously, it's not as good as his two. But it can be used to surprise opponents by beating dodges. As well as, you know, a, a source for him to play his... He spends a card to play the powerful dragon side of his attacks or throws. And it can be, it can really be really worth it sometimes to use Glimpse of the Dragon. So it's a decent ability that he has, and helps, helps him when he doesn't have access to his twos yet. Um, his overall kit, now that I go over his ability, his overall kit. Like I mentioned, he is a Troc Light, Mini Troc because of his eight damage throws and his similar speeds. Actually, no. Um, most notably. Midori's speeds are 0 .8, 0 0.8 speed, which usually doesn't matter, but it doesn't matter when he's fighting grapplers. The 0.8 speed is something to worry about. His 0.2 attack speeds can beat certain stuff, so you have to keep that in mind. Specifically, his 4 normal. I won't really get into that, but 4.2 speeds. 0.2 speed normals, even though he only has 4 as the fastest normal, is important. Um, so his kit is pretty Midori-ish, I mean Troc-ish, but his face cards... They, yeah, Whirlwind is one of Midori's, Jay is a pretty good card because Whirlwind is one of his best enders. Only one combo point, 8 damage ender that can pump for 16. It can make his throws do 24 damage, it's insane. Um, and then his Dragon Side, a Toxic Breath, allows him access to his strongest, his highest damaging combos. Like J7-8 or J, confirm it to Ace-Ace. It's really good. Um, but it's only 2.4 speed. Something note to keep in mind. His dragon, Q, his Q, um, his other, his human form Q is not remarkable. 1.2, 10. It's like a weak reversal. But Dragon Mountain, his dragon side, is basically one of the best reversals in the game because it does 14 damage, and he can combo more damage on top of it. And it's 0 0.6 speed. It's nutty. It still loses to some stuff though. So you have to keep that in mind. But 0 0.6 speed is fast. And his K, what can I say? I mean, it's um, 12 damage, can combo, it's okay. But 17 damage, can combo card. It's 1.8 speed is basically one of the fastest throws in the game. And 70 damage is the highest damage on a single card, period. So yeah, um, Midori's overall kit is good, I will say. But his weaknesses are, and why he's in B tier, is that he really needs Dragon Form to be really trending. Without Dragon Form, he is kind of a Gim character because Troc is better. Um, and finally, yeah, his other weakness is that, yeah, um, he has to worry about his lack of dodges and 
being oppressed by fast attacks. Um, he, Midori, if Midori has to worry about fast attacks while in dragon form, that can beat his dragon Q, for example, does make Midori, playing Midori a bit more stressful. Um, but overall, yeah, solid character. Weaker than Troc. Can be better than Troc, ironically, in certain matchups, because Troc discards his blocks while Midori gets to keep him. But otherwise, yeah, Midori can be can be seen as an inferior Troc that has a very superpower mode when he has access to his two. So that's why he's in B. Okay, mm, a little bit more. Almost done. Uh, C tier. Like B, but more obvious weaknesses. Um, okay, you see all these characters here? Yeah, you already know where they belong. But I can break it down one by one. Starting with... Madame Persephone. Madame Persephone is a weird character to place. I don't know. It's, it's a character that arguably could be considered B. But I think she belongs in C more because... How should I say this? <sighs> I remember her, she has a lot of matches on paper that are, that are good, but requires Persephone to win consecutive combats and manage with 75 HP. That's where her inherent problem lies. Let's let's just go to her innate first. Dominance. When you knock down the opponent, you may fetch a non-joker card from your discard pile. If you knock them down last combat, fetch up to four non-joker cards of different ranks instead. So dominance, so Quince is an infamous Vortex character, Persephone is the other infamous Vortex character, where Persephone knocks you down, trends you with a lot of options, and if you guess wrong, um, she knocks you down again and gets four cards from her discard. So that's really, really good, really good innate. And she basically plays completely around dominance. But, of course... Why is she in C tier? Um, I'll, I'll explain why. Let's go over her aces. Um, both sides of her aces. Mistress's command at 3.0 speed. Um, 3.0, pretty crappy speed. But that's because it has a powerful effect of if you want combat and Mistress's command deal, deals damage, you control the opponent's next turn until the next combat reveal. So basically, what this Mistress's Command does is give you a free, if it lands, it gives you a free combat win next turn. Where you can look at your opponent's hand, manipulate what they play, manipulate what abilities they play, counter it, and secure a knockdown for yourself. Her ace attack is amazing. You know it's only 3.0 speed, but a single A is something that your opponent has to really respect. And part of Persephone's strike lies in Mistress's Command. And of course, the other side is just as important. On your knees, 0.4 speed, which is decently fast. 16 damage ender that knocks down. This basically gives her a damaging way for her to end combos of a knockdown. And triggers dominance. So it's a key part of her game plan. She needs both sides of aces to really function. And she's a very ace-centric character. Um, yeah, and let's go to her abilities. Her 9 ability, do as told. Your opponent takes 10 damage to make their ability uncounterable. If they don't, you counter it and you discard it. Do as told is basically... It's... It's a... In most cases, Arg's counter is just better than do as told because Arg's counter counters with no prerequisites. But Persephone's counter is unique in that she can recur her counter with dominance when she knocks the opponent down, she can grab the 9 from her discard. Um, in addition, unlike Argagarg's counter, the opponent is forced to discard the card. So basically, they cannot get their ability back at all, unless they're willing to pay 10 HP. Unless they're willing to pay 10, 10 HP to play it, of course. So, do as toll can become a very great counter, late game, especially when your opponent has 10 or less HP, and they have no way of stopping it. So, do as toll is an okay counter. Um, Bear Soul... It's a really, it's a huge text box that basically can be summarized as you can control the opponent's next three cards that they want to draw and manipulate what goes into your opponent's hand. Um, this is a really good ability, Barrier Soul, to basically, you know, um, Barrier Soul is best played when you're setting up dominance loops and when you're, you know, having a good vortex, when you have a good vortex going. 
The bear soul allows you to strike your vortex by forcing opponents bad options in their hand, or options that lose to a certain thing, like for example, forcing only even only odd only odd blocks in their hand, so that they lose to even normals when they're knocked down, for example. So that's the main use of Barrier Soul, is to basically force the opponent into a corner when you're already winning. This is basically a win more ability that lets you win more when you're winning, but doesn't do as much as you want when you're losing. Um, you know, you can cheekily get rid of jokers and other good stuff that way. So deny your opponent good options and make them, yeah, keep the bad ones. So her overall kits, so yeah, the overall kit is kind of why I want to say that Persephone is not. Leaves something to be desired. Um, her normals are, okay, her normals are 0.4 speed, are fast, and, well, decently fast, and they are important to her when she has aces, because she can hit confirm her normals into aces for knockdown. Her throws are, remarkably, their only average speed. For a character that's focused all about knockdowns, she only has 0.6 speed throws. 7 to 10. She does have extra throw on her K, that's 8 speed, 8.0, and does 2 extra damage, 9 damage. But otherwise, the throws are pretty average. 7.6 being the fastest is uh, not that great. Mm. Her face guards, her Q is not syner doesn't synergize with game plan at all, it just is a get off me button that she can recur. 0 0.2 is very fast, 9 damage, bleh. Um, Power Lash is her main form of Knockdown other than aces, attacks uh, attack knockdown other than aces. So power lash is important for her. You know, 4.0 is exploitable and slow. And rapid lashes is a two point is a is a good ender when you don't care about knockdown. But that's only late game. So rapid lashes doesn't really is not really a factor until late game. So what makes yeah? So Persephone, as you can see, Persephone is a knockdown base centric character that sort of that needs aces to really get going um, needs her 10 to force the opponent to be checkmated but if she doesn't get knockdowns consecutive knockdowns she's not winning um, she needs two knockdowns in a row to trigger dominance to get four cards back otherwise she only gets one and basically somebody can find herself in a hole where she tries to set up for knockdown powers up for aces and doesn't win combat as planned. And she finds herself at a lowish hand, and that's when she starts to suffer. And Persephone's early game suffers because she has no cards in this card at the start. So she cannot get any reward from dominance whatsoever, other than, you know, unless she puts cards in this card first. So yeah, Persephone is slow to get going at start and requires a lot of combats because Persephone has kind of low damage. So it requires a lot of combats for her to win. Persephone wins can be very dominating and fulfilling because she gets so many cards, the opponent's knocked down constantly, but she needs to work hard for it. She needs to work hard for her wins, and that's why she's in C tier. And she's at 75 HP only, so she doesn't have much room for mistakes, if at all. So yeah, definitely a C tier character in my opinion. Her matchups on paper are okay, some of them, but in practice, she's hard to pilot, hard to play, um, and doesn't get as much reward as she would like to. That's what you see. Okay. Next. Battle Bass Beta. Fuck this character. <sighs> this character has a lot of text for a lot of dumb stuff. But basically, Battle Bass Beta summarized, why is he in C? Why is he, why is he in C? His attacks send them to send the opponent to long range, where the opponent cannot play throws. And BUB has a lot of properties in, from long range, like 2.2 speed junk shot that does 13 chip, K, K throw that knocks them down, 1.0 speed normals, um, overdrive makes her his makes BUB's jacks um, uninterruptible. So BUB has access to a lot of stuff in long range. And your opponent cannot throw. And the only way to get out of long range is to play block and you uh, play block at the same time your BBB plays block or hit BBB, which is easier said than done because BBB has 1.0 speed normals 
Anakin has unbeatable dodges, Anakin just simply block your reversals. So BB can be a very irritating character to play against when he achieves long range, for sure. Um, long range is, you can consider BB almost a vortex character because long range is, uh, can, 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 can be considered a vor an advantage time for BB, where your opponent has to really respect it and um, worry about long range. And BBB, late game, he can threaten his aces, Piston Hurricane, 0 0.2 speed, 21 damage. It's actually really good. It's actually one of his best, uh, one of the best aces in the game, I will say. Just don't pump it. The pump is trash. Plus 7 for an extra ace is not worth it, usually. And Beta Trust is a decent ender. So yeah, BB's aces are good and pretty central to his late game for the fast speed at close range. Um... I don't really want to get a BB so much because he is a mess of a character that has so much text. But, um, why is he in C? Well, it's because, to put it bluntly, long range unfairly affects certain characters like grapplers that are slow. I have to worry about his slowish normals. 2.8 speed normals. It's not something you have to worry about usually unless you're a grappler. Um, yeah, BB can basically play an entire game where he doesn't have to throw at all. But, so BB unfairly beats characters that are slow, but struggles very hard against characters that can easily contest his attack speeds. Sometimes BB can catch a throw attempt with a big normal and send them to long range. So that's something that BB can do when the hard read. Um, but otherwise, BB has to really respect fast characters that can contest his speeds and when he's playing against them, BBB feels like a completely different character that is completely gimped because BBB can reliably get to long range without a big reach, without a big read. BBB has to play a really awkward block, a lot of the fast attacks, power up for aces, and play for Piston Hurricane. That's his game plan. He becomes Piston Hurricane the character when he cannot play for long range reliably. Oh, not to mention, BBB's throws suck. They only do some damage. I mean, they're 0.4 speed, which is decently fast. Uh, but they only do some damage, and they don't knock down. And they only one combo point out of two. Uh, his trolls are garbage. And so against characters that are fast, or against characters that have recurring super dodge like the Grey, or recurring ace dodge like Argagarg, he's going to suffer because he's going to have to throw, and he doesn't want to do that because his trolls are bad. I guess his Keitro is kind of good, but usually he wants to save Keitro for long range. So in summary, BB is C because he unfairly skews the game for certain characters, and is beaten up pretty freely by other characters. He's a very polarizing character, and I don't think he's very healthy for the game, but he exists. So next time when you uh, play against BB, just get familiar with the character, or else he can he can beat he can beat a lot of new players because of his unfamiliarity and his weirdness with long range. All right. Rook. We got three grapplers in this game. Troc, Midori, Rook, Zane, honorary grappler. But um, Rook is considered the worst grappler, but he still, he still, Rook still has his strengths for sure and has some stuff that are unique to him that you have to play around. So, let's break down Rook, shall we? Um, Rook has 100 HP. I mean, a character of 100 HP, that's the highest HP total in the game. The second highest is Troc at 95. Um, 100 HP, really good. Mm, three combo points, okay. Um, it's hard to believe a character that with 100 HP is not is C tier, but it's just because with great strengths, like high HP comes great weaknesses. So Rook definitely has great weaknesses. Let's start with his innate. His innate rock armor. If your normal attack is hit by opponent's faster normal attack or special attack, the opponent finishes the combo. But if you're knocked knock down, you may discard two cards the same suit as your attack. If you do, your attack is not interrupted and you may finish your combo. It's basically a long way of saying he can make he can make his normal attacks armor attacks. Where if he has two cards of the same suit, he can discard them as the attack, and he can power through the opponent's attack. So rock armor 
basically allows Rook to take hits and trade well late game. Assuming he's not hit by an ace attack or an attack that knocks down. But allows Rook to at late game to when he assembles a big hand to trade and get the resources to spend for rock armor. So your opponent deals a, some some combo to Rook. Rook's like, sure, I have 100 HP, I don't care. And he hits back with like 20. We have like 10 or Q throw or 10 Q to end there for 24. Rook, Rock Armor is a really good ability, I will say. That's, it's a good innate, and it's a thing that he always likes to play for, for good reason, because it's just a reliable source of armor and a reliable armor move that he can fall back to for damage. It's really good. And of course, like any grappler, he has defense mastery, which prevents the opponent from accumulating cards from normal attacking. So both his abilities are good. His innate is great. His aces. Rook's aces. They're great, I, I will say. Um, Wall of Vines at 0 0.8 speed is practic is a reversal speed. So beats 1.0 speed attacks or slower. Um, 20 damage, can combo. But it's solid, efficient damage at 0 0.8 speed. Tree chip. Can't go wrong with it, honestly. Um... It does become a problem though when the opponent has faster than 0 0.8, but otherwise his aces are great. And Checkmate Buster, ooh, Checkmate Buster is simultaneously one of the greatest supers in the game and one of the worst. Because 0, 0.0 speed super throw that does 50 damage does not require, does not have any prerequisites like um, Troc. The unique thing is that Troc throw Beast Unleash requires him with two blocks attached. Uh, Midori's throw, Dragon Form throw, Final Dragon Buster requires him being Dragon Form. Checking Buster doesn't have any prerequisites. If he has four aces, he can throw it out. Simple as that. But, if you notice in Rook's kit, Rook doesn't have dodges. So, when he plays Checking Buster, it's a big risk for Rook. Because he only can play it raw. He cannot hit confirm it whatsoever. But your opponent still has to respect Checking Buster. And therefore, you can explore your opponent playing heavy attack range. Sometimes as Rook, if it's heavy, playing heavy attack range to, to beat Checking Buster, you can undercut his attacks or play Rock Armor. So yeah, Checking Buster does the job. If not, if only as a threat, it does the job. Um, his abilities, right? If you notice, Rook does not have dodges, so he has special dodges with abilities instead. So let's look at both of them. Entangling Vines, the first, his first special block. The block avoids block damage, knocks down attackers, and deals 5 damage to them. When it does, next turn your attacks are throws are 3 speed faster to minimum speed 1.0. Entangling Vines is really, really good, actually. It's probably, in most cases, it's probably the better of the two special blocks, because uh, Entangling Vines, basically, it gives Rook some advantage time next turn by knocking opponent down and making him faster to 1.0. So you can use Entangling Vines, and it avoids block damage too, so... It avoids the high chip, uh, high chip damage. He can ignore with entangling vines, knock the opponent down, deal five damage, and he's sped up. So he can use this opportunity to cross up with a with a normal, play one of his face cards that are, to make it 1.0 speed, or he can use it simply just to bait out your opponent's reversals. So entangling vines is a gives a rook an important next turn, where your opponent has to, um, where you can bait out your opponent's reversals. Um, and yeah, basically deprive them of the tools or just deal big damage. Either way, it's a great card. Um, and Stonewall is the second special block. It simply reflects the attack's damage back to the attacker. Oh, and your opponent doesn't dual chip. So basically Stonewall is just a no you move where opponent plays something big, like a big, um, big, so your opponent basically makes has your opponent basically has to respect Stonewall, even if they do, even if it doesn't land because the threat of Stonewall can simply dissuade your opponent from playing big, high damage attacking options because Rook can simply play as five, and reflect it back and deal a ton of damage to your opponent's face. So Stonewall is actually really nice when you put especially when your opponent has big attack, have high damage attack options. Stonewall is not great when your opponent has like. Small damage that they combo into. And his final ability, Windmill Crusher. And Windmill Crusher, if you notice, it's the same thing as Trox Super. 
where um, it beats normal attack, it beats five point or faster, but you still take, but you still take damage from normal attack. It's an armor. Obviously, his K throw is an armor move, like just like Rook, just like Trox K. Fifteen damage, really good. Um, unfortunately, Rook has no dodges, and he cannot dodge into fifteen. So he just uses this to as a really high damage throw and also to stop normal attacks. So he still needs it's still a really necessary tool in Rook's kids, his K. So his ability that's all his abilities. It's funny that his abilities aren't it's funny I don't I don't really consider Tangly by his Stonewall's abilities because they're his dodges practically. But yeah. They're abilities nonetheless. So his overall kits um something to note is that Rook's throws only do ten damage. Um, but they're only one, but they're one card, so they're efficient. But unfortunately, that makes Rook's damage kind of predictable. So Rook, Rook cannot try and gigantic throw damage unless he has check a Buster, or maybe Windmill Crusher for 15. Um, other than his throws, he's got a lot of. Um, he's got big normals, big slow normals that perfectly fit his Rock Armor game plan. Jay is good as a Jay is good as a surprise reveal for two point two speed. Q is a good ender. Mm. But what really hurts Rook is the lack of dodges because while special blocks, while having no dodges is really flavorful because he's a big stone golem, he's not gonna dodge you. Um, it's a as a hindrance to Rook because having no dodges means that you have to rely on his special blocks that. Act as dodges because special his special blocks do not return to hand when he block. He plays it, and whether it works, whether it triggers or not, he discards it. Just very much like a dodge because a dodge works the same way. You play it, whether or not your opponent, whether or not you dodge attack, you discard it. So his special dodges, his special blocks. Well, they can be good. They can be um, in special cases. They're better than dodges, but. Um, Mostly, you would prefer dodges because with dodges, he can confirm into big damage. He can confirm if Rook had dodges, he can confirm into checkmate buster. He can dodge to 50 damage. That'd be crazy. And goal bursting, unfortunately, goal bursting is when you play your Joker raw. By the way, um, goal bursting becomes really good against Rook because Rook special blocks cannot stop goal bursts. They just can't. Um, so yeah, it just makes makes Rook Rook late game really tough to navigate. Sometimes Rook has to block more than he needs to because he's slow, and if the opponent has faster than zero point eight speed attacks, he can't even use aces reliably. He's got to worry about opponent jokering. So Rook, as a Rook player, you have to be very patient. But yeah, he can be very, but he can be a very rewarding character when you're patient enough with him, when you get throw timings right. Because ten damage throws. For one card is really good and efficient. Yeah, so Rook is a very much a specialized character that belongs in C tier because he has glaring weaknesses with no dodges and uh, lack of fast attacks. But he's got his strengths as well. Okay, moving on. Two more characters. <laughs> Gwen. What can I say about Gwen? Okay. Let's start for her nades. Firstly, firstly, we can see that she has 85 HP. It's like, wow. With six combo points. That is... A six combo point character usually doesn't have that much HP. But you'll soon see why she has 85 HP. Shadow Plague, during the draw phase, draw an extra card and take two damage. It's basically the opposite of Hex on Mirkwood, where... Argogard can just sit back and the opponent takes two damage every turn. Gwen takes two damage from herself every turn while the opponent can sit back. So Gwen has to be an aggressor. But she gets um, amazing card draw from Shadow Plague. And her second innate, Relentless Strikes. Whenever you put with normal block, your non ender attack, you may discard a red and black normal attack. If you do the black one hits, you win combat, your opponent's block, the discard, and they draw a card. It's a long ability that basically prevents the opponent. If you have a black and red face card, I mean normal attack, then basically you can discard both to discard your opponent's block and have it replaced by another card on top of the deck. It's a worse time spiral. Like 
I mentioned before that only a few characters in this game beat blocks. Um, Geiger beats blocks with his attacks with Time Spiral. Onomaru does it with Guard Crush. Gwen does this with Relentless Strikes. It is basically a worse version of Time Stop because your opponent replaces a card that they discarded and Gwen has to spend a lot of cards to use Relentless Strikes, but it fits. It does fit into her game plan perfectly because Relentless Strikes does help, help do some damage with Chip and the Black Normal damage. And it does helps Gwen do extra damage and prevent the opponent from building too much. So she does need that ability. It is an ability that would be bad on it's one of those things where it's bad it'll be bad on any other character, but it fits Gwen and she needs relentless strikes along with Shadow Plague. So you can see that, you know, she's a very rushed down character based on her innate and her combo points. Her aces are not good. She has easy access to them, which is why they're not good. 1.2 speed, still 1.2 speed, 16 damage ender. It's, uh, it's comparable to um, Valerie's Masterpiece, I think. Yeah, Same speed, same damage. So for a 6 combo point character, it's good. 16 damage, 2 combo point ender. It can lead to some really high damaging combos with Dash Gorger, with her attack side of Ace. Dash Gorger. What a cool name. Um... Dreadlands Portal is the other side for Ace. It's also a central part of the game plan because 4.6 speed is an insanely fast throw and it does 22 damage. So it's a decent source of burst damage from a throw, but it cannot combo. It's also an important source of damage from Gwen dodging. She likes to dodge. If she has resources, she could dodge the Dreadlands Portal for 22. And this is a high source of burst from a dodge. So she needs Dreadlands Portal. It's not considered that good for a super troll, but she needs it for damage. So that's her ace. It's functional, and she gets it easily. Let's look at her abilities. Glorious Remedy on her 10. Glorious Remedy is actually an amazing block. When you block attack or joker discard, take no block damage, discard this card, and don't draw a card from blocking. Okay, it's 6 life. So this card buys Gwen extra turns for her to draw more cards and to be in the game. Because Gwen does two damage to herself every turn. Glorious Remedy basically essentially buys her three extra turns. It's really good. And it can, most importantly, unlike Rook special blocks, which I mentioned earlier, that discard like dodges, Glorious Remedy returns to hand until it works. So she can keep playing Glorious Remedy over and over again until the opponent runs an attack to it. Or throws it, for example. But yeah, it's a really good recurring block to have to negate to negate unnecessary chip as well and to help her gain more turns. This ability does a lot for her. She needs her 10. And her other ability, chains on Chains of Ice, Chillbane. When you hit with Chains of Ice, freeze the opponents. They skip all the stages, they'll make the rest of the turn. Next turn, attacks and throws are two speeds slower. So Chillbane is a special ability that can be tough to land, but Gwen uses basically because Chains of Ice is only 3.6 speed, right? But um, if you if you're making a, a read on a slow attack or a throw, then Chains of Ice is perfect because it basically duffs the opponent with a up to a 14 damage starter, and Chillbane prevents them from combo from jokering it because they skip all decisions for the rest of the turn. That includes playing abilities. They cannot play abilities at the end of the turn. They cannot joker. So, Chillbane is basically Gwen's access to unjokable damage that the opponent has to respect. And they have to be worried about it. And, of course, next turn, they are dis the opponent, next turn, the opponent is disadvantaged and are slower, and is slower. So, not, not only does it provide unjokable damage, it gives Gwen um, more threat next turn. Because you, put, because you are slowed down. So, yeah. Great ability. Even if she cannot trigger it, just the threat of it is good. Um, her overall kits, um, Gwen's unique in that her normals are only are all 0, 0.0 speed, so that's actually that's the fastest normal in the game. Fastest normals in the game. The second fastest is like Setsuki at 2.2, but yeah, 0, 0.0 normals. Sadly, her throw speeds are average, um, so the opponent can clash with her throws or beat it a lot of times. Her face cards. Um, J can lead to a lot of damage. 
K is card intensive, but leads to a lot of damage. Q, 0, 0.0 speed, 10 damage DP, pretty good. She needs it to get bones off of her. And um, yeah, I already mentioned Aces. So what makes Gwen a C tier character? Um, because a lot of people like to compare Gwen with like another card intensive, card drawing rushdown character like Sensuke. The main problem, the main problem with Gwen is her own innate, really, where taking two damage every turn forces her to be aggressive. Like um, rushdown characters like Sensuke, they can bait out their opponent's fast attacks and buy their time, but Gwen cannot really afford such a luxury because Gwen is. You know she's drawing a lot of cards, she's losing health every turn. So she wants to cover her cards in damage as soon as possible. And that can make Gwen very predictable because knowing that Gwen has to be aggressive to deal damage and to go in on the opponent because she can't let the opponent sit back every day and block all day, um, that can leave Gwen pretty predictable because of her innate. In addition, um, Gwen is surprisingly weak to 1.0 speed attacks. Because if you notice her speeds, she has a glaring speed hole between 0.0 Q and her 1.2 speed K and Ace. And it's a very relevant weakness for Gwen. And a lot of characters have a 1.0 speed pokes that cleanly beat everything except for her Q. So Gwen sometimes has to dodge or block a lot more than she wants to to bait out 1.0 speed attacks. So sometimes Gwen isn't even a rushdown character. Sometimes she has to contend with the opponents so does Gwen can rush down properly. She has to respect her opponent's fast speeds. Like for example, Grave spamming his 1.0 ace. Gwen has to worry about that a lot. As she has to play Qs to beat it or she has to blodge it. And you know, if Gwen has to fear fast attacks that stop her big combos, then that's more turns wasted for Gwen if she has to sit back and respect it. So yeah, overall Gwen, Gwen is a very all or nothing character. She can run over the opponents, but she can also be stuffed by a lot of things. And of course, she herself can be run she herself can die very quickly because her own innate kills her. So overall, yeah, definitely C tier character with a main weakness of her 1.0 speed hole and her innate. Finally, oh, last character, Vendetta. What a weirdo character Vendetta is. I'm finding that, now I'm not thinking about it, most of the Shadows expansions, these 10 characters, most of them are weird. Vendetta is also a weird one. Um, 75 HP, low. And his innate, carry and reach. When your normal attack is blocked or wins combat, return to your hand. It's a weird, it's a weird, it's a weird and simple innate. But, um, it's, it's an innate that I would say it's good in matchups where Vendetta can dominate with poking and is not as good in matchups where Vendetta has to respect fast stuff. So it's a, I would, but overall this innate is nice to have. But um, a lot of Vendetta's strength lies in his toolkit, his kit, and you know, his innate is just one part of it. The recurring normals, they're just one part of his uh, strength. So let's look at um let's start with Vendez Aces. Because Vendez has a lot of abilities. Actually no, only two. What the hell? Um anyway, <laughs> Vendez Aces. Vendez Aces are mediocre. Which is weird, because um Vendetta is a character that doesn't have great uh doesn't have he's not he's not Vendetta is not exactly a rushdown character because he has to build and um, maybe get normal draw from his innate, but otherwise he's not really a rushdown character. And yet his aces are not that great. Surgical Strike though, 1.0 speed, 36 damage. It's still good, um, but it can't combo, doesn't do any chip, and can be outsped by uh, reversals, which is problematic for Vendetta. So Surgical Strike, um, not as it's not. If you compare it, for example, side by side to Graves triple A super. 45 damage, 0 0.4 speed. Like it's, it's an ender. Like Surgical Strike can't even compare to Graves True Power Storms. But it's still, you know, a good source of damage for Vendetta. Maximum Ven, 
2.0 speed attack that does 4 chip, 18 damage ender. It's good. Um, Vendetta, when he has his hand is full of weird cards, he can power up for double aces for maximum Ven. And suddenly he gets good damage conversion. So maximum Ven is, I would say, almost as, basically at maximum Ven is as important as Surgical Strike for Vendetta. Overall, an okay ace. It's an okay ace. Um, his abilities. Let's start with acrobatics. Vendetta is an awkward character, but acrobatics is what makes part partly what makes Vendetta amazing. In a way that's okay, let me just explain it. You discard a dodge of acrobatics and you cancel combat completely. And you skip forward to the next turn combat immediately. Next turn your attacks and speed your attacks and throws are two speeds slower and you cannot play acrobatics again. So basically what that means is you cancel the combat currently and you skip to the next one immediately. Um, and this, what this does is basically allows Vendetta to take this, the, existence of, the existence of acrobatics allows Vendetta to take crazy risk that other characters cannot do, which is nice. Because Vendetta can simply cancel the combat and pretend it did not happen. So Vendetta is probably the strongest character against big supers other than Onimaru because of Final Authority. So Vendetta can just pretend the combat did not happen and skip to the next one. And so this can really leave the opponents hurting when they play their big super and it gets cancelled with acrobatics. Or the opponent plays their best option and acrobatics cancels it. It is card intensive. Acrobatics is card intensive and needs dodges, but um, it's a really good ability. Pretty key to Vendetta's plan. And his third ability is on his cave wall dive loop. When the opponent is knocked down, both sides of this card are speed 1.0. When you hit with either side, this card returns to your hand. It's a, it makes this K a really, really important face card for him to have. Because it acts like a normal, his recurring normals, where it returns to hand on the successful hits. And it gives him a mix-up. Making his attacks and throws 1.0. As long as he has a K. And the opponent has to really respect it and play dragon punches or DPs to escape when they're knocked down. So it's like, it's a really it's a really overloaded ability on one card. And you can see the K card itself, 12 damage on both sides is really good. And it recurs, it's crazy. So much power is on one card. So yeah, that is another great ability located on a great card. So his overall kit. So you know, the, I mentioned, I, I'm, I'm emphasizing how his K is overloaded with a lot of things. It's because that's sort of like Vendetta's whole um, weakness. Because Vendetta has, um, Carrying Reach is a really good ability, don't get me wrong. Recurring normals that return to hand, give you normal draw is really good. It basically allows you to poke your opponent's blocks, and as long as they don't have defensive mastery, you basically match their hand size. So like both of you have seven cards, you play your normal, you normal draw return to hand. You both have like you both have uh, eight cards now. Um so carry reach is really good for that. And just really good for Vendetta to keep pestering the opponent with fast pokes. Problem is, you know, carry reach to be really effective he needs his two poke. Two point two speed poke, really fast, blindingly fast, beats a lot of stuff, trades a lot of stuff, um, and recurs. Pinsir Poke is really good. Um, but without his two, he has to rely on his slow normals in order to poke with Karen Reach. And slow normals are lackluster. Um, they do do four damage, it's two and three. But yeah, he has, if he has to rely on Poke with five or six or seven, I don't know, it's more it's more risky because um, his, two, his two attack is basically the only thing that's uh, two point something speed. The other, his other normals are all beaten by two point anything speed attacks. Like for example, a claw trip at three point oh. If you play a two normal, you beat it. If you play pinch stab, if you play a two normal, you beat it. It can be a problem for Vendetta without his two. Um, acrobatics, like you know, it it needs a dodge. So Vendetta has to assemble a card, assemble his hand, and manage dodges. Two of his dodges are on fast normals. 
Um, his J is his main source of damage. Really, really good uh, damage under. Because I can do 20 damage with any three cards attached to it. But without his J, he's lacking in his end. His, he doesn't have any enders other than his ace. Q, he needs it for um, to convert into big damage. Or else his combos can be awkward. Like sometimes he can just poke into J without it. If it doesn't have a Q to attach it to the combo. K, I already mentioned before, so much power on one card. But without his K, his dodge follow-ups, he cannot dodge it. His dodge follow-ups become a lot more lackluster. Um, because dodging into K throws a huge part of his game plan. So Vendetta's tools are... The reason why he's in C tier, finally, a long -winded way, is a long-winded way of me of saying Vendetta has a lot of tools located on certain cards that he needs, but he has no real deck acceleration to get what he wants. Because other than carrying reach, other than his poke on his innate. So he needs to basically just patiently build, poke, hope he gets good cards so that he can really convert into massive damage. Vendetta is good at massive damage and tricks of acrobatics, but he needs the cards to do it and he needs the specific tools. So Vendetta can get unlucky with hands or can get really lucky with hands, you know, it depends. It depends on the luck of the game. And that's why he's in C tier. Oh, one more thing. Vendetta loses to fast characters because Vendetta doesn't have any reversals. Vendetta's fastest speed attack is 1.0. Vendetta has no reversals, so... Vendetta has the respect components where they have strong 1.0 attacks or reversals. And... I am exhausted. But that is it. This is the full tier list. I've explained and break down each character and where they belong and why they're there. Hopefully, you find this informative or interesting. Um, if you have any disagreements, let me know in the comments. And yeah, hope you all have a good day and play some Yomi.